Come on. Live. Podcast. No. We're live. We're live. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Friday live stream. Hope you guys are doing well. Alexander, how are you doing in London? Very well, except I have to say I was very depressed after the events on Wednesday in the Assange case. And um, we're, we're going through some really troubling times here. We've had a very disturbing case with Craig Murray, who's now in prison, by the way, in Scotland. And of course, we've had this very just troubling decision it, with Julian Assange. And, you know, we've already done programs about the official secrets, se se secrets developments. And the extraordinary thing is, if you read our newspapers, if you switch on our television, if you go to the radio, you don't find much discussion about these topics. Everybody is instead obsessing, or at least you'd think everybody is obsessing about the fact that an alpaca, which has been found ill, has to be put down. You know, this is some kind of a um, llama type creature from uh, Latin America, and it's been here in Britain, and it's been found ill. And this is what our great leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, wants to talk about. He doesn't want to talk about an, any al an alpaca. What? Jesus. It's ill. An alpaca. It's ill. Exactly. This is this is this is the you know a big topic of discussion. Oh. I mean, we've always been a nation a nation of animal lovers, but you know this does seem a strange topic for the leader of the opposition to pronounce about uh, he, he at a time when all of these things. He doesn't talk about Assange. Yeah. He doesn't talk about Craig Murray. He doesn't talk about official secrets. He doesn't talk about any of these things. <laughs> yeah. Well, the times we live in. All right. Well, Very hopefully the alpaca. Yeah. Hopefully the alpaca gets better. Well, <laughs> what can, what can I, I, one say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just, just uh, Mick has got the Durand mug ready to go. Coffee. The red mug with coffee and ready to go. Oh, 10% it's, it's, off it, when you use the code Real News. You have your Durand mug as well, Alexander, don't you? I absolutely do. Mine. I have my, I always do. I always have. I mean, I, I, by the way, Catherine's got, got hers upstairs. We have different things. I mean, she has uh, chamomile tea. I, I tend to go in for much stronger coffee. But <laughs> there we go. All right. Valley S is in the house and she opened things up with a $20 super chat. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you so Valley much. Valley S yeah. is always, and Valley S is also moderating. Thank you. Mm. Double. Thank you, double, Valley S, mm. for that. And uh, let's just jump right into it. Everybody, wherever you are joining us in the world, thank you very much for mm -hmm. spending your Friday with us. We will be taking super chat questions. I'll be going into the live stream uh, questions as well. And we've got also running, Alexander, we've got uh, locals live chat running as well. So mm -hmm. good day to everybody in locals. I think that's your catchphrase on your channel. It is becoming a catchphrase, Alexander, the good day, by the way. Mm. I, don't know oh, if, really? I don't know if you realize that. Probably. You don't, you don't <laughs> uh, you anyway. don't realize that okay well but, but i do becoming. always mean i do always mean a good day to people so there we okay, go okay so so good day to everybody on locals the duran.locals.com everybody locals is doing has already signed a very big cooperation with rumble they announced rumble. that uh yeah. a day or two ago it's very big uh cooperation that means they'll uh they'll be sharing their audiences they'll be integrating their services and mm. rumble has a really good um video streaming infrastructure as well so that's big news mm -hmm. and uh they're going to be taking on yt in a big way so that's good look for us on the duran.looks.com <laughs> you'll find us on rumble as well you'll find those links underneath this video and of course odyssey bitch shoot and the free speech video platform super you alexander let's talk let's talk uh retreats reset and rules ruling mm. and re-ruling mm. the world again and mm. I chose this topic because I think this week we had a lot of retreats. We're definitely yeah. going through a reset. Mm. And I think the point of the reset is to, once again, uh, have these people that have ruled over us to re-rule mm. again. Mm. But the retreats are many. And everyone in the live stream, let me know what the big retreats of the week were. I've written down one, two, three, four, five, five retreats that come to mind. Afghanistan. Big mm. retreat. Cuomo, Poland mm. retreats. Mm. Um, UK courts with Assange. Oh, that was yeah. a retreat. And I have a, 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 a very distressing one yeah. for me. Yeah. But we'll talk about it in a doubt. Yeah. 
and the fun yeah. one, which is uh, Kevin and uh, Megan. Kevin, I was gonna say Kevin, <laughs> Megan, Megan Rapinoe and Subway Sandwiches deals. So I don't know if you know that one yet, but that was a retreat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do I have, I have to say? <laughs> I have to say no, but, but I'll, I, I'm all ears, actually. Yeah. 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 So, uh, do, do I have an echo, guys? Hmm. Or I had an echo. Okay, mic was gone. I think. Okay. 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 Good. Uh, you, I also think you're a little blurry as well. Okay. okay. Well, well we, we, we've we've discussed this. Can yeah. I add? Can I you, add another? You will clear up. Can I, I will clear up. Can I add to add another retreat to all of these retreats, which is uh, that Prince Andrew, who we have done program about, has now retreated to Balmoral, <laughs> the Royal Family's exactly. castle in Scotland, but, where he is apparently hiding. There's even been comments yeah. about this in the media in Britain. And The Guardian, which is no friend of the Royal Family, has run a big uh, editorial about it. So there's a retreat, a retreat all the way to a Scottish castle to keep as yeah. far away from the media, the news, the police, everybody as possible. Okay, some people said I was I was echoing. Some people say it's mm. fine now. I'm sure it'll clear up. Alexander, some yeah. people saying you're pixelated. I'm sure you will clear up as well. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, everything will, everything will clear up in time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alexander, let's talk some retreats real quick and mm. let's get to some uh, super chats, some questions from the live stream. The first big retreat, I think it was Afghanistan. Which, yeah. is, which is a matter of weeks or months away from falling into Taliban hands. Absolutely. Now, I've just done a program about this, a short one for my channel. But I mean, I have to say, I think everybody's astonished at the way in which this uh, uh, operation in Afghanistan has gone on for 20 years. Billions, trillions of dollars. I mean, nobody can come up, by the way, with a single, single figure that everybody agrees about, about how much money was spent there. But it's, you know, off the scale. And it's all collapsing like a house of cards. And, you know, one has to ask, one has to start asking why. But anyway, regardless of that, Talib uh, Afghanistan, as you say, Taliban, look, they are now almost at the gates of Kabul. They seem to have captured all the big cities now where people were saying just two weeks ago that they couldn't. But as I discussed in another program I did in my channel, this isn't just a retreat from Afghanistan. It's a retreat from Central Asia. All that huge area that, by the way, is about the size of India, which includes places like Uzbekistan, Kaz all, all the stands, which the US was so interested in, in the early uh, 2000s. Well, the US is now being, essentially, it, it, it's now pulled out of that entire region. It's falling back under Russian and, to some extent, Chinese control. So, I mean, that's an astonishing retreat. I mean, it's a geopolitical debacle. Now, obviously, you're not going to see the media talking about that very much. Um, but if you go back, if you're able to reel back in time, if you read all the articles that were appearing in the early 2000s or the huge ambitions to build pipelines into Central Asia, to establish bases into Central Asia, the talk of Central Asia being Russia's soft underbelly, it was for a time very much a focus of neocon interest. And they have failed and they failed utterly. There are no U.S. bases there. Their attempts to reestablish bases have been blocked by the Russians, and they are being in a position where they have to pull out of Afghanistan too. Now, however this turns out, whatever happens, this is not, of course, the most important area of the world. Nobody is saying that it is, but it is a big defeat for them, and it's a big defeat for the globalists' project altogether, because Central Asia was going to be, at one point, an important part of that. Now, how that's going to turn out for Afghanistan, how that's going to turn out for the Russians, whether we're going to see a re re recurrence of Islamic fighting in Central Asia, whether that's going to create problems for the Russians and the Chinese, we'll just have to wait and see. But the fact is, as of this moment in time, the globalists, the neocons have lost. We should talk about them, by the way, because they are the people who were driving this strategy not the United States as such. I want to make a distinction between that project and the interests of the U.S. and the U.S. people, which I think is different.
Yeah, may, maybe they, maybe it's a retreat. Once again, retreat, reset, and rule. It's a retreat, yeah. but I think it's a yeah. retreat that sets up a reset and an eventual rule. But uh, Raul Pinto came in with a super chat and says, now since Afghanistan has been taken over by the Taliban, any thoughts on an IS comeback? Well, it's possible. I mean, the one thing I would say is that the Taliban and the IS simply don't like each other. I mean, and no, they don't just not like each other. They absolutely hate each other. This is true, by the way. I mean, they've they fought each other. And of course, from the Taliban point of view, they absolutely do not want to uh, share power with an organization called like IS. The uh, IS believes itself to be the caliphate, it believes that all Muslims everywhere owe it allegiance. And the Taliban doesn't want to owe allegiance to anybody. They want to be able to rule Afghanistan by themselves. With an organization, other organizations, like, you know, like um, AQ, they might be able to cooperate with for a time because AQ doesn't look to supersede the Afga the Taliban in Afghanistan, IS does. So that creates a potential conflict between the two. For the moment, the diplomacy that's happening, what the Russians and the Chinese want is for the Taliban to establish an Islamic Afghanistan and to drive out, drive out all these groups. We'll see whether that happens. At the moment, it's the only option that I can see. All right. How about the Cuomo? retreat. Mm. Isn't that something? Five years investigating Trump in New York and the taxes and all that stuff. And it's Cuomo who ends up resigning. Mm. That's a very, that you know, that's, a, that's an extremely good point. That's a very, very, very good point. Because bear in mind, of course, I mean, you know, tell, uh, Trump has been subjected to, I mean, more investigations than I know of any other human being. I mean, he has been subjected to relentless investigations extending all the way back to the day when he announced himself a candidate for the presidency back in 2015. And none of them have come up with anything. I predict the same is going to happen with all these tax investigations in uh, New York. They're going to come up with a blank, whereas Cuomo is unraveling and you know it's so interesting to, well as uh, as unraveled and what's so interesting now by the way about Cuomo is that I suddenly was reading in the Guardian that you know he was actually a terrible governor of New York well we were saying that lots of people were saying that but real back a year and you know Cuomo was the great governor who was doing it all right it was the bad orange man in the White House right who was doing it all wrong. And now suddenly, I mean, you know, it really is. It's it's Pravda. I mean, it really is Pravda. You know, suddenly, you know, we have to, you know, we all have to agree that Cuomo was terrible all along. And no admission or acceptance that before they, you know, they were telling us a completely different story about it. These people think we don't have an Internet. <laughs> we don't have all this stuff archived. Yeah. I mean, come on, we have all the videos. These guys were gushing off, off of Cuomo. What is it? The one guy on The Daily Show, Trevor Noah, called himself a Cuomo sexual. That's how that's how crazy he was for Andrew Cuomo. Give me a freaking break. Andrew Cuomo was was the the uh, the mayor of America. That's what they dubbed him, the mayor, Absolutely. the governor of America. Governor, give, me a, give me a freaking break. Man, the, the, these guys are just I know. I mean, you know, what to say? I know, I know. I mean, it really is out of you know the sort of Joe Stalin <laughs> playbook. I mean, you know, it's it's it, it, it was just bizarre reading this thing and saying to so, myself, like, you know, so I was, you know, saying to myself, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, so, fine. Yeah, but go so on. here's the thing about Cuomo. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me that someone in the uh, in the Democratic mm -hmm. wing the deep yeah. state democratic wing of, of things is kind of clearing the deck of competitors yeah. and of obstacles. That's what yeah. it looks like to me. And I think Cuomo is probably one of the, the top guys on the list as far as mm. uh, getting out of the way for, uh, I imagine for Kamala, I would imagine, or maybe someone yeah. else, maybe uh, Michelle, I don't know, mm. but someone or some group of people are, are kind of clearing out the competition, kind of like, you know, uh, Godfather like in a way, just getting rid mm. of, all these yeah. people that could be competitors yeah. come 2024.
The more I've been, the more I've been reading about this, the more I've been thinking about this, the more right I think you are. And I think this is all partly um, a product of the collapse of the Kamala project because she is so visibly failing. Um, whoever sponsored her doesn't want alternative power centers within the Democratic Party emerging. So they, they've acted rapidly and swiftly to take out a possible challenger to Kamala come 2024. And when, when I say Kamala, I mean, it may not be Kamala, but you know, whoever takes over from Kamala as the anointed candidate. So that's, that, in my opinion, is what this whole thing is all about. I mean, it's, it's quite clear. And you know, I, I don't know all the, the inside stories, but if the person who made the decision, if their initials uh, are BMO, well, <laughs> I don't think we're, you know, probably very far wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, that, that's what it smells like to me, but we'll, we'll yeah. see. We'll see it play out come 2024, 2023, yeah, probably. Absolutely. I mean, I, the thing I'm going to say again, and, and this is something which um, I figured out long ago, and I think a lot of people have figured it out, which is that Obama is very much a person who operates in the shadows. And he's very skilled at that kind of thing. Whatever else he's good or bad at, that side of politics he's very good at. So I, I think he's extremely good at uh, uh, playing these sort of games. And I, I generally think at some level he's involved in this. This is my own personal view. Now, of course, I can't prove that. I'm not pretending that this is something that is you know, open and Cut, clear cut, but that's what it looks like to me because I don't believe for one moment that people didn't know about all the things that Cuomo was up to. So there we go. He, he, look, they, he, he gone. Yeah, go, go ahead. He, I mean, he, 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 he achieved too much prominence last year. That didn't matter last year because they needed somebody to set up against Trump. They thought that Kamala would be the great person who would take over. When it became clear that she's not up to that, they had to remove the big icon of last year because he, you know you can't have two suns in the in the sky, as one person once put it to me. <laughs> yeah, and Cuomo was was ambitious and arrogant, and Absolutely. I'm sure he said, "Look, uh, Kamala's a joke. I'm going to take over the party. I'm going to run in 2024." And yeah. I imagine that the Obama wing said. Not so fast. You no. served your purpose. Mm. Sit sit in the corner quietly and just govern New York and we'll leave it at that. And I'm sure that Cuomo probably thought that he was more powerful than what he really was. And and Obama That's just kind of the Obama wing, because the Obama wing is Obama, Susan mm. Rice, you know, Loretta Lynch, all types of uh all all, the, all of these people that are that I think are competing with the Clinton wing and probably have overtaken the Clinton wing for uh, mm. control of the of the DNC. They knew what they knew what Cuomo was doing for decades upon decades. They knew what he was up to. They knew he was a sleaze ball and a scumbag. Absolutely. Just like they knew about Harvey Weinstein that he was a sleaze ball and a scumbag. And I always said that the Harvey Weinstein Me Too thing was uh, the guy was an absolute scumbag, but everybody in Hollywood knew what he was doing. And oh, Harvey please. Weinstein was connected to Clinton and uh he got taken out as well. So I I imagine that this is kind of Obama clearing the deck. Absolutely. I mean, this is the, this is the title of uh, the Guardian article. Andrew Cuomo ran New York badly <laughs> because he ran a toxic workplace. And of course, it then goes on to say how badly he ran it. And it does seem to me as if it's exactly as you said. They all knew what he was doing. And now they found the opportunity to get him out of the way. Yeah, because that's how they control they need, it. Absolutely. This is this is how it is. This is how politics now works in the United States. It's not open competition between people who want to run for the presidency or who want to run businesses in Hollywood or wherever it is. It's done through smears and intrigue and backstairs uh, uh, wire pulling. And that's that's how things have become. I mean, that's what's overtaking the republic. It's quite a, quite an alarming fact. And, you know, you don't have to be a fan of Andrew Cuomo. God help us. I never was. I think I never liked him. But, I mean, the way that it's been engineered, it, I mean, it should make people a bit worried. Yeah. All right. Well, let's shift gears and go to Poland. Mm. What a retreat that was. 
what well, a retreat this yeah. is. Poland mm. has a folded yeah. to the European Union yeah. with the whole yeah. uh, court judiciary mm. thing. We've got a video mm. coming out on this most likely tomorrow. But this was a big, uh, a big loss for Poland, a big loss mm. for the Polish people, a big loss for the European Union. Uh, it leaves <laughs> Viktor Orban isolated. Yeah. Um, and it means that the European Union has now started to get control of the judiciary of every yeah. single EU member state. That's why mm. this was so important. And mm. when Poland folded mm. to the uh, to the technocrats, bureaucrats, and terrorists in Brussels, well, mm. they, they essentially opened the door for the European Union to take control of the judiciary in every single EU member state. It means if you have the euro, if you're using the euro currency, you've ceded financial control, to the European Union, political control. Okay, that's a given. They already have political control in most of the countries, and now you've uh, pretty much ceded judiciary mm. control to the absolutely. European Union. A absolutely. I mean, we've gone through an extraordinary evolution because bear in mind, it all started back in the 1960s when the European Court of Justice simply announced it. It it, it was never given this power by the member states. It simply said that it had that power in a famous court judgment, this is back in the 60s, which is that European law, EU law, it was in those days EEC law, takes precedence over national law. And the European Court of Justice is the single body that adjudicates it. So that was that was already decided way back in the 1960s. Now, bear in mind, in the 1960s, uh, EEC law was purely economic and financial. And it was very restricted. It was intended purely to make it possible to operate what was in then those days called the common market. But over the years, over the decades, that look, that body of law called the Aquis, the Aki, has expanded to every area of national life and um, or, and social life. I mean, every area of life. And now you have a court which has e never at any point retreated from this extraordinary claim that it made back in the 1960s that it has the power to in that it that its law the law it administers take precedence over all other law but now it's taking a further step again because what it is saying is that it has a right to decide the framework the structure of the courts in individual national states. There is no EU law that says that. It's not set out in any treaty. It's not set out in any regulation or directive of the European Union. But suddenly, the European Court of Justice has said, we don't only just administer EU law, which takes precedence over yours, EU law now being, as I said, all embracing, but we also are able to decide how your courts are structured and to a great extent, how your judges are appointed or dismissed. That's an extraordinary expansion of power by the EU centre. And it was, I think, extremely cleverly directed at Poland, where for all kinds of economic and uh, historic reasons, a, uh, a, a big majority of the population still support the EU and still support Poland's membership of the EU and where the government doesn't have a big majority in terms of its electoral support and where it anyway make, is made up of a rather fractious coalition. So it was a cunningly done thing and it's a tremendous expansion of the power of the EU centre. I mean, this decision is going to have enormous implications. So, you know, if in Greece, for example, I'll just give the example of Greece, you decide that you want to change the structure of our Supreme Court, the Aeropagos, as it's called, well, the EU may say, well, you know, you can't do that because that's going to go against the, the, the system that uh, the uh, European Court of Justice thinks is proper. And your judges ultimately are responsible for us not to you, not to any law that your national parliament might want to enact. So this is an extraordinary step. Again, it's receiving far too little attention, deliberately, but it is a vast expansion of EU power. 
and Poland folded when it was uh, um, when it was pushed, and it folded because its economy is dependent on EU subsidies, and because of course people in Poland still, for historic reasons, tend to support very strongly the EU. They haven't yet been exposed to its harsher side. Maybe when it, the when they are sentiment there will change but this is a big event and a huge story and it's a clear-cut win for the eu yeah uh uk courts there's a yeah. big one the uk yeah. courts and assange yeah i i i i, I we did a video on this yesterday absolutely, so I, there's not i mean not, add a little I mean, bit we, more if you want a little bit more but uh, well i i can't add much to what we said there i mean i'm terribly depressed by this decision i mean this is i mean this is uh, first of all um, I mean, it's it's um, the decision itself is wrong, but when the judge back in January, Judge Baritza, made the decision that Assange should not be extradited to the United States because of health issues and because concerns about the kind of conditions he might be find himself in if he was sent there. I mean, in any other case, in any other case involving any other country and in any other prisoner, that would be the end of the matter. I mean, it, it, it's all but inconceivable, in my opinion, that that kind of decision based on health, health grounds would have been subject to appeal. But instead, they did appeal. They kept Assange in prison. And you know, I repeat again, a point I hammer away, he is in prison, even though the judge said he should not be extradited. And even though he's not serving any kind of sentence for any crime he's supposed to have committed, I mean, he's not convicted of anything. He's not serving a sentence. So why is he in prison? And now that appeal is going to continue. And the whole question of his health is being reopened on, in my opinion, utterly, uh, uh, utterly bizarre grounds. Because his his um, future wife, the, the mother of his children, wanted privacy for herself and for her children. Something which, by the way, is a human right. And you know, because she wanted to exercise those right, well, that right, and was, because was a human right, was a human right, was a human. Now right. there are well, no. Well, are well, no I well, I know. Well, I know. Well, I know. Well, I know. There's a god. I know, I know, but you know that's that's still you're, you're so you're so 2019, Alexander. You're... Well, I'm probably. I mean, but you know that's. But you know this is this is the legal system that um, I know. It's the legal system, and I have to tell you something else. By the way, I mean this. The the one thing I am going to say about this decision is it's cut through. <laughs> um, it, it it it's so um it's so radical that um all sorts of people, lawyers legal professors people like that who up to up to now have been looking the other way even they have been i think stunned that this has happened just as i know that a lot of people were stunned when the the british supreme court refused to look at the case of craig murray i mean that also shocked a lot of people so you know it has cut through it's it's perhaps the moment when for a lot of people in the working in the legal world, the penny has dropped. But, you know, very late, far too late in the day, perhaps for Assange. We just have to wait and see what happens in, in, in October. The one thing I'm going to say is this. I do know that there are people in the judiciary who are very, very, very unhappy about the direction things are taking. Um, the the original judge who was looking at this case in the appeal court, uh, a, a judge called Jonathan Swift, <laughs> strange name, uh, took a different view, <laughs> um, Mr. Justice Swift. But um, the fact is that uh, it may be, it, I, you know, we, we mustn't give up hope that in October things might still turn out otherwise. There's still some judges. But in the meantime, we have to prepare for another battle, another big legal battle in the United States. And of course, this has always been a political case. And I've always said that people need to mobilize, people need to make their feelings known, people need to campaign, and we will see what happens. Yeah, um, look, people do need to do that, but uh, yeah. 
the people that are joining us right now, this is an an audience that is plugged into what's going on in the world. When yeah, you leave absolutely. this audience right now, yeah. many people are unaware as to what's going on with Assange, and that's deliberate. So much in the same way that big tech, I believe, did a test run with the Hunter Biden thing, and they yeah. completely silenced the Hunter Biden thing successfully. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like, mm -hmm. a, like a little pilot yeah. for them, and it worked. Yeah. They're just going to bury the, the Assange oh, thing no. if and when it does go to, uh, to the United States. And uh, big tech has shown that they have the power to just completely, you know, disappear news topics. And m not all of the population, but most of the population won't get any wind of it. I mean, they just won't well, know. Well, so well, if you, protest if you, if you, and, and organize to, yeah. to get some justice for Assange is, you know, something that would happen yeah. if people knew what was going on. But big tech makes sure that people don't know what was going on. I, I, I'm going to make an observation here, and this is something because I've obviously I've been fairly involved in Assange-related matters, and it's absolutely fascinating to see who supports Assange in Britain and who does not. And his support increases the lower down the social scale you go. And I have to say this also, to some extent, the younger people become. People who go to the internet, and people who are under severe economic and social stress tend to see through all the things about Assange. They tend to be his supporters. It's the professional classes who tend to be most opposed to him. But I do think that offers some hope because it does show that if you could mobilize, there is a big part of the population you could tap into. And it's, it's there. It's just that organizing to support it or, or, or to organize it effectively is proving so difficult at the moment. I'm going to say something else, which is, of course, the lockdown and the pandemic has made people very tired. And, of course, it's also become the all-absorbing thing. I mean, By design. The thing. Well, but it's, it is. I mean, the fact is that is how it works. Yeah, so By design. It's, well, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's very, very difficult to get them to focus on one individual. Uh, I'm in a cynical mood. Uh, I, I can know. tell. I, I'm I can, in a cynical I can, mood. But by tell. design, though, well, by design, well, you know, the, the, what, what it does, you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah. The effects of, of the yo-yo restrictions, what I yeah. call them, the yo-yo restrictions, yeah. is that they tire people out mentally. That's, yeah. that's by yeah. design. So that when stuff yeah. Yeah. like Assange, when stuff like uh, the EU taking over the judiciary yeah. of the European Union, yeah. When stuff like uh, Afghanistan or anything, or Hunter Biden yeah. speaking to to Russian prostitutes, <laughs> which is a story is that came out. When, uh, when stuff like that comes out, people are so tired, they're just no, so no. tuned out. All they're saying is, "I just want to get a cup of coffee without having someone check my passport." This is by design. Yeah. Uh, well, at least yeah. that's one of the benefits of having these. Uh, these oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, no question about it. I mean, as I said, it, well, it's what I said. I mean, people are exhausted. I mean, people are tired and they, you know, they're too tired to think about what goes on with one individual. But, you know, people who um, I've talked to even and this is, this is one of the strangest things, uh, 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 people who come to to visit us, it is fascinating to see. Because, you know, my wife has put a pro free Assange poster on Alwyn, but it's fascinating to see who mention it and who are most responsive to that. And as I said, it, 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 it's, you know, workmen, it's people who do those sort of, that sort of thing. You talk about the sort of so-called educated classes, but just say nothing. And I do find that very striking. Yeah, well, since we're talking about individuals, how about Andrew? How about that one? Mm. I wonder if a deal was worked out between Andrew and uh, between the UK and the US with Andrew and Assange. I wonder. Uh, I, well, who knows? <laughs> who knows? I mean, and I, I, I suspect there's all sorts of th there's all sorts of discussions and negotiations and things going on the way. I, I, I do wonder. I mean, I really wonder whether there's some sort of agreement be made in the United States that they're going to throw the prince under the bus <laughs> and uh, uh, spare all the others. I mean, you know, you, you need a big victim to try to persuade the masses that justice has been done. So you go after him 
and then of course all the others and we've got to be very careful by the way we shouldn't really name people too much because there are legal consequences for doing that just saying but you know whether that's the real plan because i don't get the impression and i say this straightforwardly i don't get the impression that there is any investigation any serious investigation going on in the united states about who else was involved. Uh, what I've just said, many people on our threads are going to say, well, that's absolutely obvious. Being cynical again is absolutely justified in this, in this case as in so many other things. But I think that's absolutely the case. And so you need to find some big sacrificial victim to uh, uh, you know, satisfy the masses. So you go after this uh, rather unintelligent prince not the sharpest knife, as I've often said in the draw, somebody who is the ultimate insider because he's a member of the royal family, but who ultimately isn't brainy enough, to say it crudely, to pull any levers or to make any real difference. Yeah. The timing. Look at yeah. the timing with Andrew and, and Asaj. Look at the timing. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you, you know, um, you have Andrew. And this news about Andrew. And mm. uh, you also have a, a reset. And mm. I'll jump to this one reset because Bill Gates is getting rehabilitated. He's been on the, oh. uh, yeah, this week he's been talking to the press a whole bunch. And he announced that he's going to be giving $15 billion now to, uh, to climate stuff. I don't even, all the climate stuff to be, to be quite yeah. honest, it just melds into the same thing. I don't, I don't even pay attention to it anymore. But anyway, he's giving $15 billion to climate things and yeah. blocking out the sun and, and some, yeah. some yeah. crazy stuff like that. But Bill Gates rehabilitate, being rehabilitated again. Mm. There, there, there's a reset for you. There's mm. a reset I wish we didn't have to see. Well, absolutely. The interesting thing about Bill Gates, and this is something that you know I've heard about more, more than one person says, which is the more money he gives away, the richer he becomes. It's a fact. <laughs> Apparently, he's now richer now than he was when he gave most of his fortune away. So how does that work? I'd love to know. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were talking about insiders and about how Prince Andrew is the ultimate insider. The real ultimate insider is not, of course, Prince Andrew. He's there because of his birth and where he is. But the real ultimate insider, the real oligarch, the real person with power is Bill Gates. And the simple fact is, I mean, you talk about him being rehabilitated. I never really felt that he was dehabilitated, if I can put it that way. I didn't feel that he'd ever really been condemned. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we now know about him and about connections he has. We've had this divorce, but I never really felt that anybody was really attacking him in any serious way. So there he is. He's still the great power. He's still the man of enormous influence. As far as I can see, his power, if anything, is growing, has been all along. As I said, he's, had, he's got a difficult issue with his uh, uh, wife. But I just think, you know, in terms of the real effect in the power he has, I don't see that changes anything. Mm. Yeah, you, you know, he was, um, mm. he, he was too much in the media and yeah. he was pushing the stuff too much. Yeah. They started to hate him. And so they got even more. Mm. And uh, no. they needed him to to cool off for a couple of weeks. But That's now he's right. back. He gave an interview to Financial Times. He's been Absolutely. speaking to, I believe, MSNBC and CNN. Oh, oh CNN. He did a he did an interview with uh, with uh, the Vanderbilt guy, uh, Anderson yeah. Cooper, yeah. <laughs> another oligarch oligarch family. Um, so so then they did a video and and uh, a video interview and mm. you know the whole thing was centered around his uh, his charity, which is which is nothing more than a tax exemption uh, mm. slush fund. That's all it is. He's not absolutely. giving money away to anybody, really. Um, no, no, yeah. absolutely. That's exactly what it is. As I said, the, the, the more he gives away, the richer he becomes because it all comes back to him. Yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 it multiplies. <laughs> That's the thing to always understand about this because that, I mean, as I say, he is really the person who is at, you know, at the core of the system. But, you know, he, you're right. He was he was allowed to cool off for a little, but he's back, and he always will be. I mean, he's always there until either either you know 
uh, um, you know, time catches up with him and he has to move to another place, or alternatively, the world changes and people like that lose their power, which can happen one day, I just predict it will. But until that day comes, people like him will always be there and they will always be getting more powerful because the, the structure of society today makes it so. Yeah. How about uh, the Biden energy reset? How about that? Mm. The first thing he does when he's in office is that he uh, he dismantles mm. the pipeline, the Keystone Pipeline. Mm. And now he's asking uh, Saudi Arabia or he's asking the mm. Gulf nations to uh, to pump out more oil and more gas and all that stuff. How about that? I know. Well, well how, how indeed? How about that? And how about the fact, by the way, that since he became president, U.S. oil imports from Russia have been growing. I mean, it's a strange fact to think about, but I mean, the the oil uh, oil issue. We you know we talk about Russia being this petro state. Well, it's now becoming a petro state, which not it's not a petro state, but anyway. But if if it is, it's one that's becoming subsidised by the US importing oil from Russia. So of course they've had to switch. The reason they're doing that, and of course the real reason they're doing this, is because they're getting worried about inflation. They're getting worried about twenty twenty four. The inflation numbers are bad. The the uh, inflation was again five point four percent. If you want to believe those figures, which I suspect fewer and fewer people do, uh, um, um, last last month. So there's no sign of um, you know growth. Uh, uh, of inflation growth really slackening. In fact, I understand it's becoming more broad-based and the economy is slowing, slowing faster than was it, it was expected to do. So the, the, what they want is another stimulus. It's another stimulus, ultimately. They want lower oil prices. Uh, so they want their friends, the Saudis, as a result, to increase production and all this business about green energy and all that. Well, frankly, that must take second place to holding the line in 2022. That's that's what it's all about, as far as I can see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's do some uh, super chats. Mm -hmm. Let's get some questions going. Uh, from Flying Boar, I won't be sad if Erdogan faces regime change from the West because the mess he created in Syria, Libya and Iraq. Absolutely. But be careful what you wish for. Now, look, I'm no fan of Erdogan. I mean, we, we've spoken many times about these programs. He's done. I think his, his policy has been completely misguided in Syria. You know, I, that's sorry. That was that's an understated use of words, not just misguided. I mean, his policy in places like Syria has been appalling in Libya. It's been appalling in the Caucasus. It's made things, in my opinion, it's created a dangerous situation in many places. And at the same time, knowing Turkey and what a volatile and unstable place it is, you do not want to see a regime change in a country like that. I mean, carrying out regime change in a place like Turkey could set off problems which will make even the problems in Syria look small. And that's saying something. So... Um, Regime change is not a good idea in any shape or form, especially when someone like John Bolton is organizing it. Yeah, well, John Bolton, regime change never ends well for no. any country of any size. No. No. Uh, let's see, Canale Italiano, two pound super chat. Have either of you taken the Satan juice, the jabby? <laughs> I think we've answered this before, but uh, <laughs> yeah. This, God, I, don't, I, I don't know why they make such a well. We know why they make such a big deal out of this. But look, I don't mm. think I don't think the uh, yeah. anyone's information, medical information, should be should, absolutely should be uh, given to anybody other than your yeah. doctor. It shouldn't be on a QR code. Yeah. It shouldn't be on yeah. a passport. Yeah. It shouldn't yeah. be to a government. Nobody. Absolutely. Nobody. I, I, I take exactly the same line. And by the way, this is a consistent line. I never asked people that question. And I don't think that question should be answered. And I think if we start answering those kind of questions in that kind of way, then all we are doing is we're playing into the hands of those people who think that this kind of information should be made public and who then think that they can police us because of it. So I, I think that this is a confidential matter and it should be treated as such. As I said, I don't ask people that question. And I don't think we should uh, ask those ask questions like that of people. That's my own personal view. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you, Canale Italiano, for that question. GEC also moderating is in the house. GEC comes through with a super chat. Pete Buttigieg in with uh, the deep state involved with voting shenanigans in the Democratic primary and has support of the Clinton establishment could replace Kamala, question mark. Mm. I think he's burnt. They, they, they mm. burnt that Buttigieg card. I think I agree. I agree. I mean, let's be straightforward about this. I mean, they, it was another card that they tried to play briefly uh, uh, in 2019, 2020. And well, it didn't fly. He's just not likable. Yeah. He's just he, not likable. He's just yeah, not exactly. likable. He's not authentic. Exactly. He's not likable. Exactly. And he showed that he's not that powerful because he no. was one of the first people, him and Warren were the two people mm. that uh, got out of the way right away for mm. Biden. So that Biden mm. can can win. They're the first people that pulled out, which I think kind of shows that they're they're lower on the totem pole. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I don't think Buttigieg. No. Not a likable dude. They no. tried him. They tried it, no. but it didn't work out. From uh Richard, what mm. major country do you think will have a populist president first? Whew. Well, I'm gonna make a guess, it'll surprise people depending on if he runs in 2024, um, perhaps it'll be the United States again with, um, uh, uh, you know, DJT coming back. I could see it. I can't see it in Europe if I have to be straightforward about it at the moment. Um, um, I, the, there are, let's, let's be straightforward about it. There are people, there is resistance in Europe and it's, it's actually Despite all the things we've said, I think it's actually growing. I think people are becoming more sceptical, more critical. Certainly in France, they are becoming extremely critical. Uh, um, you know, you, you, France is almost on the point of... I, I've been hearing people from France talking about it being on, heading towards some kind of an insurrectionary situation there. Whether, whether that's true or not, I, I'm, I'm not going to speculate. But I know that there's bubbling anger and disaffection in France, which is rising. But it's the political class they've closed up in Europe. And it's very difficult to see anybody breaking through. In the United States, one man did break through in 2016. And it's not impossible he could come back in 2024. I want to make one very quick observation. I think this expression populist, I don't particularly like it because not because the word itself is bad, but because of the way it's used. I mean, obviously, a populist leader is a popular leader, popular with the people and therefore close to them. It should be a good word. It should be a good word, but it's been used to imply something the opposite, that somebody is a demagogue or something of that kind. And it's very much been taken over and captured by elitist people, globalist people, and invested with meanings that are different from the ones <laughs> it should actually have. So let's be very careful when we use that word. In my opinion, a populist, populist in a democracy is a good thing. You should not have to justify yourself being a populist in a democracy. And when people use that word in a sneering kind of way, well, that tells you an awful lot about the fact that they're fundamentally not Democrats. So that I just wanted to make that point. <laughs> they've done that with so many words. Yeah, populist shouldn't be a bad word, but they've turned every word upside down. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> the way we're going, exactly. the way we're moving right now, saying exactly. woman or saying man is going to be a bad word. Absolutely. Saying Christian is going to be a bad word. <laughs> the way yeah, we're in yeah. the in the direction that the West is heading. That's how Absolutely. upside down everything is. Absolutely. I mean, you know, a, a, a person, a, a political leader is popular in a democracy. And that's somehow a bad thing. I mean, what, what does that mean? And what kind of a democracy is that? You want your leader to be as unpopular as possible, and that's a democracy for you. I mean, this is an inversion of language. It, they, they turn language around, but precisely for that reason, because that word has been captured and misused in the way that it is, I, I prefer personally to avoid it, simply because it's become so entangled with all the sort of corruption of language that we're seeing uh, happen all around us. Yeah, well, that's also 
part of the plan. Destroy Absolutely. the language. Well, of course it is. I mean, it's something that, you know, um, um, my wife, especially, who is an English literature academic, is very concerned about, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, from Reguero, five euro super chat. Reset democracy itself, authoritarian rule in the name of perpetual state of emergency. Divide and control the population using coof passports. Well, yes, D divide and the I, population. You know, we, yeah, we, 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 we've talked we've talked about this so many times, but that's this is absolutely true. I mean, you know, the they are heading remorselessly towards the most authoritarian responses. And it has to be partly by intention, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, there may be some people, there may be some people who are deluded and weak and are going along with the others because they're told this by, you know, yeah, scientists It's called the whatever. mainstream media. <laughs> but, well, exactly. But ultimately, ultimately, I mean, there has to be an element of intention about not just an element. I mean, yeah, the, probably a large part of this has to be intention. Yeah, the deluded and weak are the mainstream media, and they are going along with this. Well, also, can I can I also say many of the leaders are deluded and weak? I mean, yeah, but, but they're not, in on the not, game. I, I no, I mean, yeah, it depends yeah, well, what level some you of are. Them, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, always, and I really do repeat this: don't make the mistake of thinking that the Ursulas and the Christine Lagards and all those people and uh, dare I say, you, know, you can think of all kinds of other people. Mark Rutas are particularly bright. They're not. They really are not. Uh, um, um, you only have to spend a little time with those people to find out very quickly how limited they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. er Erdogan figured out uh, Badger Layer real no, quick. Absolutely. <laughs> Since we're absolutely. talking about Erdogan. Absolutely. absolutely. 40, 40. And Michelle. He made them yeah. both look really, really bad. Abs absolutely. <laughs> the, you know, the Manfred Webers, who's, you know, all those sort of people. They're not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We're ruled by yeah. idiots. <laughs> We're ruled, but well, 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 you know, kind of ruled mind. by idiots. They're not really kind ruling us, but yeah. So, so, so there are some people who are very far from being idiots. I mean, whatever Bill Gates, shadows, whatever, yeah. exactly, whatever, whatever Bill Gates is, he's not a fool. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't call him a fool, not by any means. But uh, uh, you know, the Christine Lagarde's and the Manfred Weber's, well, yes, <laughs> they are fools most of the time. I mean, it, it, they, they, they may be very skilled, as I said, at the backstair side of politics, but whenever they're really exposed to real public criticism and attention, you see how they unravel. I'm just going to add one point, by the way, which is I, I should say one thing, which is that, of course, the, the, their, their leader in Europe, if you like, who is um, Angela Merkel, is supposedly departing the scene in September. And I do wonder whether things like what's just happened with Poland is not an attempt to clear the deck what, for when she's gone. So, um, you know, because they don't have quite such a important person, such a strong figure to take over from her. At least they haven't found a replacement for Angela yet. So just bear that in mind too. Yeah, she's doing a farewell tour. She actually said she's oh, going yeah, to visit absolutely. Putin and she's going to visit Zelensky. Yeah. Wouldn't that be? That's, that's a great tour for people to uh, to sign up to. Everybody, get your tickets. The yeah. Angela Merkel farewell tour. I would <laughs> Limited love, supply. I, I, I would love to be a fly on the wall in those in those discussions. I mean, it's fairly well known that Merkel and Putin dislike each other. Well, does that surprise anybody? Yeah, they and say yet, he got his dog that that one time when he was meeting with her. There was this big yeah. uh, rumor that he got his dog out because she's terrified of dogs, yeah. and he put his dog uh, to like sit right in front of her. I know. I don't know if that's I know. true. Or not. <laughs> it, well, it, it certainly it certainly happened, and yet you know, at the same time, the, the, throughout the time, they they, they um, pretend to be the best of friends. So he sends her he sends her flowers. She sends him beer, <laughs> crates of beer. They have, they have this very weird and strange relationship with each other. Um, but, you know, they do take each other very seriously. That That is indisputable. So it'd be interesting to know what, what goes on. And do bear in mind that Merkel and Putin have often had in Russia, always in Russia, private meetings with no interpreters present no one else present, just one-on-one, -on -one, just them in a room. And I would love to know what goes on in those discussions and what they really say to each other. Of course, 
the Russians will have had it all taped because of microphones. And they, one day we will find out when those tapes are published. But certainly some, some very interesting conversations have been had between those two. What he's going to say to Zelensky, I really do wonder. <laughs> Nothing. What are you mm. going to say to Zelensky? The guy doesn't run anything. He's toast. Know, he's toast, man. He's he toast. is toast. He is absolutely toast. I mean, it might be a courtesy tour as much as anything else. Yeah. But I don't think so, actually. I think that she's probably going there to basically tell Zelensky that um, your time is up. And we're going to talk about retreats more in this program. I think they're gradually edging towards retreating from Ukraine also. I, 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 you know, I don't think it's going to happen immediately, but I think that we've already starting to see a sort of pulling back. You remember we did that program a short time ago when Blinken and Victoria Nuland went to Kiev and basically said to Zelensky, you know, we're just here to take what we can. And I suspect that Merkel is probably going to long to Zelensky and say, well, you know, the days when we were really going to support you 100 percent, they're passing. The world is changing. You haven't got Sevastopol to give us. You haven't. We're, we're building these pipelines that are going to circumvent you. Um, you know, your number is up, basically. Yeah, I, I wonder whether back. that's whether that's what the, the re, is yeah. really going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pulling back from various places. I wouldn't be surprised if they pull back from Ukraine. But all these pullbacks, no. they they make me very nervous in a way that okay, they're good. Yeah. They're pulling back from Ukraine, Afghanistan. It, but I'm looking at it from another angle, in that I think a lot of these pullbacks are kind of the the globalists and the elites and all these people in power kind of saying, okay, we're going to we're going to dismantle the the. We're going to dismantle Europe via the EU. We're going to dismantle the United States. Yeah. And we're going to pull back from these places that didn't really give us what we wanted. And we're going to reload. And we're going to make the one final push for this new, the new world government. We're going to make the final push. We're going to gather all our resources. We're going to leave the places that haven't given us the dividends that we thought they were going to give us. We're going to, we're going to destroy the places that we want to destroy and get rid of, yeah. i.e., you the European Union and the United States, let's just call it what it is, you know, dismantle those uh, those uh, countries and regions. They use not a country, but dismantle all of that and then make the final big push. Exactly. I think I think I think you've hit the nail on. That. I think that's exactly right. What they what they're doing is they, they realize and I, this is the big revelation that's come to them this year that geopolitically they have a fight on their hands. I mean, they've now got this big Eurasian power block which they sort of sort of created themselves. They have to find some way to deal with that. So they're cutting, lot, cutting their losses in places like Afghanistan, Central Asia, I suspect before very long Ukraine, possibly Syria. They're going to tighten control on those places that they control, which is their core area, Europe, North America, other places, Latin America, quite possibly, and then they're going to come storming back. That's the plan. That's what they're really out to do. I mean, they haven't given up on any of their grander ambitions. I don't think these people are capable of giving up on those things. And, uh, you know, we're going to see a renewed push um, in a few years' time once they've stabilized the core as they see it. So they're not going to let themselves get distracted by adventures in Afghanistan and Ukraine and such places where it's 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 tricky for them. So they're now focusing back on the call on the call. And that's what I think this is all about. Yeah. All right. Let's go to uh, some more super chats. Canale Italiano says, what are the geopolitical implications of Georgia's rejection of EU imperialism with the recent anti alphabet riots? Does the Orthodox Church and rising stars on grassroots right, yeah. on the grassroots right, threaten U.S. hegemony there. Well, Georgia is a fascinating country, and of course, it's been very unstable for a long time. I mean, you know, there's been this, there, 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 there was the so-called, I think it was the Rose Revolution, which brought Saakashvili to power. He's still wandering around the world, by the way, including Ukraine and other places. And then the governments that have emerged since then are still basically western oriented but now what they're discovering is that 
orienting your country, directing your country towards the EU, which used to be a massively popular policy in Georgia, has co comes with a terrible price. And this is starting to become increasingly opposed. And you start to see all sorts of things that are beginning to develop in Georgia. The problem with Georgia, and it comes back to a point that Alex made on a program problem. about same Poland. With the, yeah, it's, I was going to say the same thing. It's the Poland problem. Yeah, yeah it's the Poland problem. It's that th th this, this fear of Russia clouds their understanding. The, it, it, they lose focus and clarity because they still think that the real threat to them comes from Russia. And so they still cozy up or feel they have to be close to the EU which ultimately is existentially far more, of a, far more of a danger to them. Let's be straightforward about this. I mean, Georgia has been close to Russia for centuries. I mean, it was part of the Russian Empire, then the Soviet Union, whatever. Georgians remained Georgians throughout that time. The EU doesn't want them to remain Georgians. I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, it's already talking about, as we said, changing alphabets, doing all kinds of things for that. It's... It, it's far more homogenizing than Russia, the relation than Russia would ever want to be. Maybe once upon a time in Stalin's time, who was of course a Georgian, they the, the Soviets wanted to achieve some kind of uniformity. They didn't succeed, but maybe they wanted it. Today's Russia isn't about that at all. And that's a fundamental shift and change. I don't think Georgians understand that. And I think, you know, uh, if we're talking about the two breakaway republics, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, I think the Georgians need to accept that those are lost. And the people there don't want to be a part of Georgia. They were put, made part of Georgia by Stalin way back in the 30s. I know there'll be all sorts of people who will take issue with that. But whatever, whatever the history, the fact is these territories are lost. Ultimately, it's Georgia's own independence that Georgians need to be worried about. And as I said, the threat to that doesn't today come from Moscow. It comes from Brussels. Yeah. No, look, the people in Georgia, the people in Poland, all these people need to understand that mm -hmm. uh, you cannot have your own country, your own identity, your own culture, um, your own sovereignty and be part of no. the European Union. No, it does not no. work for the no. European Union. It's either you are fully integrated, integrated into the EU blob or you're or you're destroyed for them. That's no. the way they see it. Uh, when the whole Ukraine thing broke out in 2013, mm. I remembered it was Barroso. And I think it was Barroso who, at the time who was uh, the head honcho of the EU. And I remember it. Putin said, Ukraine, you can be part of an agreement with the European Union, and you can also have mm. an agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union. Mm. No problem. Mm. You can have both. And I think it was Barroso who said, no, 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 yes, no, no. You either have to choose between us or the Eurasian Economic Union. You cannot exactly. be part of both. That is the EU mentality. Absolutely. It is that George Bush, you're either with us or you're against us. So the people of Georgia, just like the people of Poland are going to find out, is that if you choose the EU, you have to give up your language, you have to yeah. give up your religion, you have to give up your culture, your identity, your history, yeah. all of it. It all Absolutely. goes, and it all goes to some blob in some yeah. technocrat glass structure, which uh, is just looking to make robots of everybody. Yeah. Get them yes. all passported up, all QR coded yeah. up, and make them into uh, little good robots. That yes. is that is it. That is yes. that's the choice, and Poland's going to realize that, and I think Georgia is going to have to realize that too. There is an anti alphabet. Are you kidding me? Look what they're doing to Hungary. Orban or Orban passed the law well, to protect kids, and Mark Rutte is is losing his freaking mind. Absolutely. I mean, you know, exactly. And, and you know, I come back to this. I mean, the structure of the courts in a country should not have anything to do with Brussels. I mean, that's not their business. I mean, what the courts decide, well, in some cases, you could say maybe it is. Maybe, you know, if they put someone like Assange on trial, maybe that is an issue you could talk about. But how you organize your courts, that should be entirely your affair. 
And the EU says, no, that's not acceptable. We decide how your courts should be run. Not just what de decisions they might make in big issues, but in everything. And your courts, therefore, are controlled now by us. Now, Moscow has no interest in controlling courts in Tbilisi. That's the difference. Did Maybe they try to did... pull the same BS Ma on, uh, on the UK with the courts? Wasn't that one of the, Absolute, the major yeah. issues that Absolute. the EU said, no, UK, your courts, all your stuff is going to be run by us, not by Absolute. you? It was a fundamental issue. It was one of the key points about Brexit. It was one of the things people were constantly bringing up. They were saying, a lot of people were saying, we don't want our laws to be administered for us by a court in, uh, uh, by a court in Europe uh, uh, and, by, uh, and, made, and our laws made for us by Brussels. It's an absolutely central issue because that is, creates a legal structure which is incompatible with our national life. The whole point about it was, the whole thing about Brexit was, take back control. Con British laws made in Britain, adapted to British conditions for British people. Take back control. Control of your borders, control of your laws. The Europe doesn't, European Union doesn't want you to have control of either. And it doesn't want you to have control of your money too. <laughs> or your body. Well, that's I'll just throw that in there. <laughs> that 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 that, inc that that also, as we've seen, and that's what the big battle in Hungary is going to be about. Yeah. Um, let's see. Where are we here? From Anatoly Alexander. Be careful. Judging by Assange's case, open season on journalists is coming to the UK. Uh, a prison cell with a sign reserved. For, oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well not probably not. Totally. No, no, I don't think. I don't, <laughs> well, well all, 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 all I will say is, I, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 I sometimes had to say, you know, that I did speak with careful words. I, I, I don't think, to be realistic or frank with it, that if they, if they're going to start coming after many other people, which I'm sure they will, that I'm very high on that list. Anyway, here I am for the moment, and yeah. I carry on exactly as always. No, we, we said it in our last video. The people they're going to go after, if they do journalism. get power, yeah, they're going to get the useful Man. idiots because these are the people that they're going to yeah. look at and yeah. just say, these are the most dangerous yeah. people because yeah, they'll turn on anybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is Yuri Bezimov, I tell you, the guy nailed it. That is how the mm. Soviets thought. That's how these yeah. people think. They're going to yeah. use them to get power, and then they're going to take a look around. And they're going to say, "Well, who should we go after first? Mm. Let's go after the same people that got us into power. These useful idiots, because they're dangerous. They mm. can't be trusted. Mm. They have no loyalty. That's that's how they're going to look at it. And they're going to and they're going to go after them first. Mm. So we're safe, Alexander. <laughs> no, I agree. Well. <laughs> Uh, for the moment, I don't. I don't. Feel, to be honest, I don't feel under any particular no. risk. At, risk at the moment. I mean, I <laughs> generally. Do, I. 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 I, gen, I generally don't. I mean, um, you know, I, I, some people. Uh, you. You have to go a lot further than. Be a lot more prominent than I am to be, uh, frankly, of interest. And I don't think I'm of very great interest. But we can see Not you clearly now. Someone in the chat said so. You did clear up a while you. ago. So there you're not you pixelated. Go. There you go. Anyway, anyway, regardless of that, whether I'm of interest to them or not, I, uh, you know, here I, here, here I, here I stand. I can do no other. That was what Martin Luther, <laughs> Luke, Martin Luther said to the emperor, and that's my position too. <laughs> hey man, has a super chat which says Afghanistan, Taiwan, Ukraine, and I dare say even the promised land are all geopolitical anomalies and indefensible militarily retreat may yeah. be necessary or we may lose the qn trying to the queen the queen trying to save the pawns i think that's exactly the thinking actually uh, i i i should say i don't think everybody in washington to put it mildly is signed up to this on the contrary you're going to find all kinds of people who are very very angry who are going to be saying you know this is a terrible betrayal of you know all that we are and all these people we're fighting for i mean you're going to i mean i i was reading a fascinating piece by lieutenant colonel vindman remember him <laughs> talking of he read a long long piece in the atlantic rehashing all the old story about the first impeachment which i mean it was just weird to read but he he obviously will be extremely angry 
if they say pull back from Ukraine. And there'll be people in the U US who are very angry about that. But overall, I think the predominant view at the moment is that since we are now once again back in a struggle between power blocks, we are go not going to put ourselves out to defend the pawns when that will weaken our overall game. So I think that is the overall thinking at the moment. And um, it's exactly that. It's draw back, protect the core, reorganize, restructure, and then go back on the attack. And I think that's exactly what they intend to do. All right. Simon Enifer says, cheer up, Alex. You don't risk taking extreme measures if you are winning. Five well, thank you. Thank you for well, that. Well, yeah, and thank you. Very, very good point, actually. And I think we are, by the way, in spite of everything. I mean, I think that's the other thing I wanted to say. The fact that they're coming after people in this kind of way. I, a really strong political, self-confident political system, let's be straightforward about it, would be able to absorb dissident views and, opini and opinions. As the United States once upon a time, not very long ago, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, good. So the fact that they're having to take all these steps shows that they feel themselves um, um, under threat and experiencing their retreat. It, it, it does have a look of desperation and anger about it. So let's let's not overlook that also. Flying Boar says, Lukashenko recently talking about stepping down soon and he doesn't want to yeah. integrate with Russia. Is he still planning to put Russia and the West against each other? I think that even Lukashenko himself starting to understand that that game has spent itself. I mean, he's closed the borders to Ukraine and to Lithuania and the Baltic states. He's now, uh, there's now very complex negotiations underway between uh, Belarus and the Russians, which look to be very much intended to basically integrate the industrial and agricultural parts of Belarus's economy into Russia. I think he's making these rather brave comments about, you know, keeping Belarus independent, because I think for the moment that's very much what he wants and what perhaps the Russians also want. And it also reassures Belarusians that their country is not going to be absorbed by this colossus next door. But I think the idea, the game of playing the, U the EU, playing the West and Russia off against each other has failed completely. And I think Lukashenko himself understands it. I think he is going to go, by the way, before very long. The only question is, who's going to take over from him? And I suspect there's probably very, very complicated and detailed discussions going on at the moment about about precisely that. Yeah, Putin and Russia are working on it. Absolutely. They'll figure out who takes over. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. There's nowhere else for Lukashenko to go. There's nowhere else for Lukashenko to go. And I mean, the interesting thing is, and this is perhaps the most interesting development. I mean, you know, there was this recent opinion poll which showed that Russia is, remains if far and away the most popular country amongst Belarusians. And in fact, it seems its popularity has grown, if anything, over the last few months, which is really very interesting. Whereas Tikhonovsky's popularity is now, I think, about 7%. So it's collapsed. So um, it, it's, it looks as if there is a shift in opinion in Belarus in exactly the opposite direction from the ones that uh, some people in the West expected. And uh, Mr. Protasevich, the man who was taken off the plane, he gave a big interview to RT, by the way, in which he essentially said the same thing. Now, of course, we have to be careful basing anything about him because we don't know how free he is to really express his views. But he did seem to think that the whole um, attempt to overthrow Lukashenko in the way that it was done and to reorient Belarus to the West has failed. Yeah. All right. Anatoly says, do you think the Taliban will take Kabul or will they share power with the current administration, at least de jure? They are, there are advantages to both. They will not share power with the current administration because at the moment, I think they're absolutely convinced that they can take Kabul. And I think they're right. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm 
I, I, I never thought they would do that. I did think they would win. We've done programs about this on this on on the Duran. I've done many programs about this issue on the uh, on uh, my own channel. YT, by the way, doesn't like me doing it. And one of my programs recently, they absolutely hammered. But that's another story. But I, I always thought the Taliban were going to win. I didn't expect it to happen so fast. I mean, this is it. This looks like a collapse. But um, I don't think they're going to show power with the new government the one thing they may do and should do if they are wise is do what the russians are advising them to do which is that once they gain power they should broaden their government by bringing other communities into it but whether they will do that now i i think is problematic because given the speed and completeness of what looks like a total victory, they may feel they don't have to. That would be a big mistake, in my opinion, judging from Afghan history, recent Afghan history. But, you know, people do make these terrible mistakes when they become dizzy with success and think that they have won and that they don't have to bargain. We'll see. Hmm. Uh, from An Anatoly, it's good to be hopeful, but if the worst comes to pass, me and many others will donate to you, to you Alexander. <laughs> Anatoly, man. <laughs> Anatoly, Anatoly, uh, the Duran.locals.com. Absolutely. Five dollars. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Supp support our channel. Don't worry thank, about yeah, me. Don't, worry, don't, don't really worry. don't worry about me. I mean, thank, I, don't, thank you, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel under any kind thank. of pressure or stress i haven't <laughs> even looked totally. i mean absolutely but thank you anyway exactly all right uh amrit says uh china russia alliance helps china oh boy one one minute china russia allowance uh, alliance helps china gain some critical technology in the same way germany was able to get access uh to to, to italian access to there's no there's no spaces so i'm having to to separate the words here, to get access to Italian development in jet engine second. Second World War, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah jet absolutely. engine, submarine, and guided rocket, Luigi Stippa Nella Carrera. Yeah, I mean, this is true. I mean, absolutely, the Chinese are definitely getting technological help from the Russians in multiple fields. Um, and I was reading. I, I was reading a, a, a very interesting article recently about how the Chinese jet, uh, stealth fighter, the J twenty, like the Russian stealth fighter, the Sukhoi fifty seven, they're both at the moment operating with old generation engines, which limits their performance capabilities. But there is said to be a new Russian engine, the uh, I thirty, coming. And the Chinese have also been trying to develop a new engine. But this article suggested that, in fact, what's actually going to happen is that before very long, the J-20 and the Su-25 will both be using the same engine, which will be the Russian one. And it may be that there'll be technology transfers or it may be something else. Uh, or it may be a simple, straightforward uh, uh, sale of engine technology. Who knows? But the, o the other thing is we also know because Putin himself told us that the Russians have provided an enormous amount of technical support and help to the Chinese to enable the Chinese to uh, develop their early warning strategic system. So, you know, to keep a tr track on whether what the US missiles and things are doing. So there's an enormous amount of technology transfer from the Russians to the Chinese. I suspect, by the way, that there is some technology transfer the other direction also. So, you know, who knows? The Chinese are very advanced in some fields, like uh, uh, drone technology. They make microprocessors, for example, which we know about. There could be some transfer as well. So that undoubtedly is happening. And undoubtedly, it's giving the Chinese a huge boost. The big one, and um, this isn't me, this is, I take this from Scott Ritter, by the way, is, of course, the Russians are now the world leaders in hypersonic technology. You see that there's even been a case in uh, Moscow now where apparently a Western intelligence agency 
was trying to get uh, was trying to suborn a Russian scientist involved in hypersonics to try to get access to Russian technology on hypersonics. Um, the Chinese will almost certainly be very interested in that technology too. If they're able to get that, combine that with their enormous industrial power and capabilities, well, that could be a huge strategic game changer. But don't think, as I said, it's only in one direction. Um, because for the Russians, the alliance with China, which is what essentially it all is, gives them both geostrategic depth and weight as they face off against the West in Europe. But it also, and it also gives them access to investment capital, which is the one thing that Russia most lacks. They don't have vast capital reserves. They were once looking to get capital from the West. That didn't come, so they're turning towards the East. So that's, that's where the whole thing comes together. Mm -hmm. All right, from uh, Tweak wants to know, changing the topic a little bit, have you read the longer telegram by the Atlantic Council? It would be interesting to hear your thoughts about it. I absolutely did read the longer telegram by the Atlantic Council. I, I have to f say, I mean, it was when it, longer. This refers to the long telegram that was written by George Kennan. This is a brilliant American diplomat of the 1940s. And it's often said that, you know, that long telegram set out the containment strategy to contain the Soviet Union. Though it's important to stress that Kennan himself was a, a, a brilliant uh, intellectual, somebody who knew Russia extraordinarily well, was very much of a Russophile, had a great sense of feel for the Russian people, and was somebody who strongly opposed, by the way, the expansion of NATO in the 1990s. So somebody... We don't quite know whom. There's some suggestions that it was that it was Tony Blinken or somebody close to him. It could very well be. Wrote this even longer telegram. I mean, which is not really a longer telegram. A long, long, long article in the Atlantic Council website, which basically tries to say that the U.S. should do to China what uh, the, the U.S. did in the 1940s to the Soviet Union, which is to pursue a policy of containment. I have to say that when you put the two side by side, you see the one that Kennan wrote, full of intelligence and insight and understanding, whereas this longer telegram seems to me to lack all of those things. It did understand that China is the main challenge to the United States. But it didn't, it seems to me, come up with any very coherent response to that. And the one positive suggestion that it made, which is that the United States seeks some kind of rapprochement with Russia in order to isolate China, is a policy which the United States is not pursuing in any coherent way, and which, to my mind, is already past its sell-by date. So I, I found it a fascinating thing, this thing written on the Atlantic Council website. As I said, it had some realistic points, but it did show, for me, the decline in understanding of the world between the US of the 1940s and the US of today, are the one positive suggestion he did make, which is to seek a, uh, a rapprochement with Russia. It just isn't happening. In fact, it's, it's already visibly failing. All right, Leafy Bug says, there is a massive competence deficit at the upper echelons of the globalist project. These people are wildly ambitious, but not especially capable. Their policies are obviously destroying the economic base required to fulfill their objectives. You asked, that is so right. That is so brilliantly and well put. And it is absolutely right. Their, their um, policies, their objectives are far beyond their intellectual uh, competencies and capabilities. They are very, very good in gaining their hands on the levers of power. But their project ultimately is, in the worst sense, a utopian one. And they don't have the skill anyway to implement it. They don't have the brilliance. You need to be a genius to do 
what they want to do. And they may think that's what they are, but they're not. The problem is the damage they're going to do in the process before this utopian project fails is going to be calamitous. Yeah. Anatoly says, uh, Barrett denied a shot mandate appeal. Your comments. No, I haven't. This Supreme is a new Court, case. Yes, yeah, yeah Amy, this is a new. I, I, I haven't seen this case. So, I, I until I read the judgment or at least get some uh, handle on it, um, I, I won't be able to. I think. Comment. I think it's in reference to Indiana. I think. I don't know. I don't probably. Is that, okay. Is, uh, what, uh, probably. What you're is. referencing yeah. the Indiana yes. case, which went up yes. to uh, to appeal, yeah. and they turned yeah. it down again. Yes. Yes. Yeah. By by the way. What a disappointment. Uh, indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, the, no, the well. Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> Quite. But can I just say, though, I mean, uh, for those who haven't seen it, I mean, we did a fascinating interview with uh, a Robert Barnes, who's, uh, you know, right at the center of the thick of it, if you like, with all these legal challenges, which um, you can see the entirety of it on Locals and Super U. And, uh, you know, that, that I think you'll find intellectually enlightening. <laughs> yeah. What a disappointment. Barrett yeah. Kavanaugh. Oh well. Oh well. Well, I, I, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh for me is 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 the real is. I mean, he's let that that judgment he did a few weeks ago, in which he said, "Oh, you know, well, something's absolutely illegal and completely wrong, but nonetheless, you know, it's all about to end, so <laughs> let it continue." And then you know, the, the CDC comes along and says, "Well, we're going to continue anyway, not just for a few weeks, but forever, basically." I mean, that, was one of the most ludicrous decisions I've ever seen. That man is a justice of the Supreme Court, and he comes up with a decision like that. I mean, really. Shows how scared they, these people are, because, I mean, clearly he's very rattled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From uh, GEC, James from ColbertReport.com did a great series last year on Mr. Gates and how his charities are set up to create a power monopoly in the medical industry. Yeah, I've actually, yeah. I think I've seen those mm. documentaries, yeah. to be honest. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. a power monopoly in the health yeah, industry absolutely. in general. Yeah. yeah. He he game planned it. He game planned yeah. it well when he left Microsoft. Oh, absolutely. As I said, whatever else he is, this man is this man is seriously clever, actually. I mean, in a, in a very limited way, he's not he's not a He's not, again, the genius he believes himself to be. But he is certainly no fool. I mean, he's certainly no Ursula van der Leyen. Let me put it that way. Mm. <laughs> I still love I mean, he, he, he is the real, he's the real thing. Yeah. He is the real, he is, he is the person who has, who, who has power and exercises it. Anatoly says, uh, comments on Mike Lindell's three-day event. That he was streaming. Mike Lindell is is back, back in uh, in the spotlight. Uh, yeah, he's fearless. Is... The guys, the guys, fearless. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, I mean, he's more, it, more yeah. your th yeah, Karen, Karen. No, I mean, I mean, yeah. No, I, I well, this is something that we'll probably is. discuss in locals because a lot of what Mike yeah. Lindell discusses is probably something that is better suited yeah. for for locals. All, all the U.S. content now, the election stuff, and and all that stuff is a. Uh, you can't really talk about it on YouTube, to no. be quite honest. No. But, um, yeah, lawsuits are still yeah. flying. Billion-dollar lawsuits, Alexander, against yeah. all these people from uh, the software company, the election software company, are still going out. So yeah. it's being litigated. From uh, Amrit, an EU politician said that if the EU country medals are combined, it has more medals than anyone. <laughs> Well, they're I idiots. mean, you know, uh, they're just such idiots. I know, I they're, they're, they're such idiots. They really are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you I mean, for is, that. I didn't know that. It, it's 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 an interesting thought, though. I mean, you know, the, the reality is, I mean, you can motivate young people to go and run uh, and you know and race, and of course, if they if they have their, their nation's flag and their anthem, it's it means things, something it, to it, them. It, it gives you but a glimpse. That, as yeah. Yeah. Take that. Yeah. I mean, take take that away. Give them something different. You know, a different, undifferentiated thing. You might find that they're not quite as keen to compete in competitive sport in the same way that they they are now. So it might actually not be quite the energizing thing that some people think it would be. 
Just saying. It, it gives you a glimpse. A comment like that from an EU politician gives you a glimpse as to how these people think. They actually Absolutely. do believe that the EU is a country or should be a country. And uh, oh, yeah. they, it, it, it's just proof to the point that they want to do away with independent sovereign nations inside of Europe, that they yeah. want to have this one monolith of a, of a place called the European Union. It's, mm. th that's it. That's how they think. That is exactly mm. how they're looking at things. Mm. I agree. I agree. From uh, Mark Hewitt, uh, Marine Le Pen is losing traction in France. Should, yeah. should her more Eurosceptic niece usurp her? Well, I, I don't think there's time between now and the election. I mean, there's clearly tensions, but uh, we, we've discussed uh, Marine Le Pen. I mean, she watered down her message so much in order to make herself acceptable that all that's happened is that she's lost definition and uh, she's, she's definitely losing traction. Now, that gives you a, a sense again, though, of how difficult it is to break through in France. Um, whether her niece will challenge her, we'll see but not, not between now and 2022. Bad username says, great insight, gentlemen. Five pounds mm. of shot. Thank you very much. Bad username for that. Raul Pinto says, Biden admin is discussing mandating COOF shots for interstate travel in the U.S. while the southern border remains open for migration, of course. Yeah. I, I, what else can you expect in this clown world? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, and that... That comment, again, does point out the absurd contradictions in so many things. Yeah. Uh, from Flying Boar, why was uh, Karimov of Uzbekistan hostile towards Putin's Russia before? That's a very interesting and good question, actually. I mean, he, he was... Somebody who I think was very important in Uzbek politics, even during the Soviet Union times. And of course, he was a member of the Politburo and he was very accustomed to running things himself in Uzbekistan and being very much the strong man there. And I, I think that a little bit like Lukashenko, he saw Putin as this jumped up figure who'd suddenly risen vast and high. And I think he said to himself, you know, who is this person? Why should he take this influential and important role in regional politics when I am so much more experienced and uh, successful in some ways than he is? And I think very much like Lukashenko, the result was a, a very high degree of resentment. Uh, look, Karimov did run a very tough regime in Uzbekistan also. And there may have been some problems there, too, because he was trying to justify this very tough regime that he was running in Uzbekistan by uh, promoting very strongly um, Uzbekization. In other words, uh, uh, reducing Russian influence, in bringing in Uzbeks to take over things, uh, uh, lowering the level of the you know, use of the Russian language, all, the, all those sort of things. So that may have played a big part in it. I would say that towards the end of his period uh, in power, he began to shift. He began to became, become more open to uh, get closer to the Russians again when he found the Americans that he was working with very closely. He even, ha he even hosted an American base for a time that the Americans were become, beginning to interfere more in Uzbek politics than he liked. But anyway, since his death, um, Uzbekistan, it seems to me, has been rapidly putting behind his, itself his policies. And, of course, there's now Russian exercises, military exercises with the Uzbek military. And I think we'll see Uzbekistan before very long integrate fully with the Russian-led uh, Russian um, institutions the Collective Security Treaty Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union. So I think it's going to it's going to change. I think it is changing fast. Okay, from uh, let's see, J J H W. Uh, if you're in trouble in the UK, hire dogs of war, not lawyers. <laughs> uh -huh. uh. Cry, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. It's from a speech of Mark Antony's in Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. Well, I don't, I've got two dogs. 
They're absolutely beautiful, gentle creatures. I don't think either of them is here at the moment. Uh, uh, they're both golden retrievers. They're certainly do not dogs of war, whatever they are. And I'm not a warlike man. <laughs> okay, Rocky Lux. <laughs> Will there be a forced reset with Greece and their historical relationship with Serbia? Mitilineos SA has forgotten agreements with Yugoslavia to develop the Trepka mines in northern Kosovo. Mm, I would, well, I, I think there would be a lot of opposition in, in, in Greece to that, to be honest, but possibly. Uh, I mean, certainly, I'm going to say straight away, there are people in the Greek political class who would be very open to doing that. I think there would still be quite a lot of popular resistance to doing it. But in the political class, I think they would go for it, actually, um, because our political class in Greece is completely Europeanized. Oh, yeah. That's an understatement. That's an understatement, yeah. yeah. Forget about it. Greece is cooked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 350 billion in debt for the past 15 years. And yeah. it's only growing. They're cooked. Yeah. Um, from Flying Boar, update on Ukraine. They're asking the U.S. to put anti-missile defense system there. Yeah, I think this is a fantasy again. I think that uh, uh, the more Ukraine uh, uh, feels itself isolated, the more grandiloquent it becomes. They've also, by the way, redeployed some troops apparently to parts uh, to you know to, to, to the contact line. They're, I mean, they're coming up with these extraordinary statements to get over the sort of crushing sense of defeat they've suffered over Nord Stream 2. And, I mean, they are they are really upset about that. So they come up with these grandiloquent statements about, you know, getting the US to send rockets and anti-ballistic missile deterrents, get them to come deploy US troops there. I just don't see the US doing it because I think from the US point of view, Ukraine is no longer a strategic asset in any meaningful sense. And I think that deploying U.S. troops there would be something that would put those troops right in the very rapid fire, firing line of Russian hypersonic systems, which I don't think the U.S. wants. And I don't think they want to be put in a situation also where they might find themselves having to fight the Russians in the event that Ukraine foolishly were to launch some kind of aggression against Russia. So I think these are fantastic utopian things that the Ukrainians are, are, are basically retreating into as they sense that support for them is waning. Um, Rich says, Italy is a civilization country and the EU is just a bad era in its 3000 year history. These people have sustained greater threats unlike North Europe. Absolutely. I mean, the, uh, uh, Italy is one of the great centres of European civilization. They and, they and us in Greece. Um, and no doubt they will come through and perhaps one day, you know, Greek, Greece will too. But of course, the damage being done in the meantime should not be underestimated. By the way, we're doing programmes now with our colleagues from our Italian channel and uh, our Italian partners will be doing a lot of coverage of events in Italy. So do, do look out for that. All right, Michael Ende sends us SEK50. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Michael, for that. And uh, where are we? What is the reaction in the EU on Russia-China military drills and further alliance from Flying Boar? Do you know, I think people in Europe are largely in denial about this. The, the British, there's some concern about it in Britain. But the major concern in Britain, in my opinion, it comes from people who are very, very hostile to Russia and who are worried that the United States is now going to be more interested in uh, facing up against China than they, they are about, you know, uh, having uh, 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 and will lose interest in Russia. So I think there's an element of that about this. But I think generally, if you're talking about the EU leadership, um, they're not, I don't think, very aware of the fact, they haven't really clocked up to the fact that there is this Eurasian colossus <laughs> now emerging. And I, I don't think they've really understood this. And of course, if you're talking about some European countries, Germany specifically, I think that there are some people in Germany who still want to be at some hanker at some point level. They still want to be a part of a kind of Chinese system, whilst at the same time keeping the benefits of remaining in the American one. 
So I, I don't think the Europeans have yet woken up to the full implications of this. Some people in Britain have, though for all the reasons, for the reasons that, that I said. Some people in Eastern Europe perhaps have done so also. But the, the EU centre, I, I don't think they really have. I think these people still tend to think of Europe very much as the centre of the world. That's the outlook they were brought up with. They can't really imagine that far away China is a genuine alternative pole to them. I think it's just beyond their, their you know, their ability to conceive to conceive or think in that kind of way. All right, Alison Scheller says, talking of retreats, 52 Texas Democrats retreat to DC to stop a quorum vote over voter ID laws. Yeah, boy, was that, boy, did that whole thing backfire on them. Yeah. <laughs> they all Absolutely. returned all, all sick and Absolutely. Now, Texas, now Texas is going after them. That whole thing was just a disaster. Absolutely, I completely agree. I mean, actually, it was, it was, an, it was a, it was a shocking thing that they did, in fact. Who, who advises these people to do these things? Well, they, they just ended up looking totally dumb. They did, exactly. That's exactly what happened. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Flying Boar, what's the update on Lithuania and China's situation on Taiwan? That is such an interesting story. I mean, why Lithuania, of all places, should want to take on China, goodness knows. But the Lithuania, Lithuania see, it has got itself into the position of being what the French call more royalist than the king. So the United States saw these issues now with China. So Lithuania feels that it must join in somehow. So that it agreeing that there should be some kind of representative office for Taiwan under the name Taiwan. That has absolutely enraged China, which is, of course, was bound to do. And now the Chinese are saying that, you know, Russia and China need to gang up against Lithuania. Poor Lithuania. I, I mean, I don't think it's going to do any real damage to Lithuania, but I mean, it's... It, it, I, I don't see why Lithuania needs to involve itself in these sort of quarrels. I suppose they think that they can gain some friends in Washington by doing that. But maybe they're being put up to it. Maybe they're being put up to it, goodness knows. But I, I mean, I, I, I think for all the friends they get in Washington, what they will find is that those friends, if, they, if it really comes to a showdown, are not really going to be there for them. I think the Russians, by the way, are very interested in Lithuania. I think this is another illusion that people in Lithuania have that, you know, I'm absolutely sure that Putin doesn't wake up every morning and ask his officials, you know, what's going on in Vilnius. I'm sure that isn't at all the situation. The Chinese are very angry. The Russians, as I said, are, I think, basically uninterested in Lithuania, uh, yeah. except to the extent that it affects Belarus, which they are interested in. I don't think it's going to do any harm to Lithuania, but I just don't see the sense of getting involved in this quarrel. All right. Leafy Bug wants to know what happened to the billionaire Greek shippers after the 2019 debt crisis? Are they still a distinct class in Greek society? Uh, absolutely. And they're as rich as ever, becoming more so, if anything. <laughs> I mean, they, yeah. they, you know, I will say this. I mean, I, 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 at one time, I was quite close to a couple of ship owners. And uh, it's a very, very, um, it's a very, very tough business, actually, being a ship owner. Because, of course, world trade can be very volatile. You can end up with lots of ships and no cargoes, and that can cost you huge amounts of money. You need, you need strong nerves, and uh, uh, nerves of steel, in fact. And you need real, real instinct and real flair to do it. Greek ship owners are very, very good at that sort of thing. I mean, they, they have that ability to, to, to do that, and many of them have very, very deep pockets. And, uh, you know, you sort of see the constellation of Greek shipping families changing all the time. But they are a class unto themselves. They're not actually very integrated to, 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 to a surprising degree. They're, they're sort of separate in some ways from Greek life. They, they scarcely ever pay any taxes there, for example. At least many of them don't. So they are a distinct class. And the, but they're but they're an interesting one, and uh, you know they they do have a buccaneering side which is uh, indisputable. Mm -hmm. 
From Mark Steele, hello lads. I have a question about my homeland of Canada and the looming election. Will the globalist unicorn rider win? You tell us, I hope not. <laughs> Why would he? I mean, it, it, it tells you so much about the world that we there's even a high chance, as far as I can see, that he probably will win. Even despite, you know, the corruption scandals, the uh, major errors, the weird things. But, you know, apparently there's still a large number of people who support all that. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I have to say um, there are there are leaders and leaders. I mean, I, I can't stomach Macron in France, but if there's one particular leader who really grates on me it's trudeau i think he'll win unfortunately yeah, I think, unfor unfortunately i think he will i yeah. think he's i think he's still um i think the momentum the zeitgeist if you like what the germans call the zeitgeist still works is still working for him unfortunately from eugene 10 pound super chat do you think we're in for a long autumn and winter of massive widespread riots over the apartheid passports on a scale akin to the london riots in 2011 <laughs> but chaos in every major city of every nation we're going to see lots of protests um we might see some riots mainly in europe i don't see much sign of it at the moment in the us i don't know what's going to happen in the us but i i predict that it will fade out and um, I, I suspect that in most places, such as in Germany, for example, most people will accept it. There is one big exception, and that is France, where it seems to me that this is all combining now with all sorts of other issues that the French, French people have been feeling very unhappy about for a very, very long time. But the trouble is, in France... I mean, it's increasingly clear there is no political leadership for these movements. And without leadership, it's very difficult to create a movement. You c lots of people can be unhappy. Lots of people can protest. Lots of people can protest vigorously. But at the end of the day, unless you have a revolution, whom are you going to vote for? And if Marine Le Pen's star is fading for all the reasons we said, well, your options go. Uh, now, I think eventually France being the kind of country that it is, it you know something might indeed happen there. But I have to say, last time I was I was in France, which was in 2017. It's a long time now. I, I was deeply dismayed by how demoralised I, I found the country. Actually, that's that's not quite true. I was I was in uh, um, France just before the. Uh, pandemic, but that was that was basically to to go to the Alps. But you know, when I went to in a, in a real town in France, as I said, I was astonished at how demoralized and sad the place had become. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm here in Greece, and I was in Cyprus, and I'll be honest, people have maybe there was a, a day or two of protests, but yeah, it, it, it is yeah. August. I'll preface yeah. it with saying it is August, yeah. but so far people have accepted yeah. the um, yeah. the QR codes and and the scanning yeah. of the passports. Yeah. I mean, and as I said, and as I said, I predict, I, I predict, they, I predict they will in most places. Yeah, in Germany, I'll, they definitely will. I'll throw in the Germany, caveat. Yeah, I'll throw the caveat in there that if you're outdoors, they're not scanning no. here. They don't go around like in France. The police they don't go around and mm. check. So if you're outdoors. Mm. You're OK mm -hmm. to sit there, whatever your status is. But if you do go indoors, decide to sit indoors, mm -hmm. I see more and more places uh, scanning the yeah. uh, the QR codes. And yes. uh, it'll be interesting to see in the winter when you can't sit outside what's going to yeah. happen. That Absolutely. I don't know. When everyone yeah. has to go inside to sit, that I don't know what's going to happen then. Absolutely. But we'll see. Mm. We'll see. Um, I'm 50-50 on it. Maybe people will hit the streets. Maybe they won't. I don't know. It's a tough call. Yeah. France yeah. is definitely the country that they will protest. Absolutely. But as I said, we, we, we will see what... I mean, even in France, though, don't, don't hold out very high expectations of an immediate change. Um, I mean, the French state is still very strong. It's, it's extremely strong. I mean, it's, 
but but there are rumblings. I mean, the, the army is known to be unhappy, and uh, even the police apparently are not as happy as they, I mean, are not as you know secure as they were. But I still think in France, ultimately, things will remain for the moment much as they are. Mm. If there's any country that's going to push back on the passports and it'll have a global effect or a Western effect, it'll be the United States. Yeah, I agree with that. If the United States doesn't uh, push back, then uh, I think Europe I, is just going to go along with it and I agree we're, we're with all that. cooked. I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. I mean, again, we, we were talking about that in that interview with Robert Barnes, which, as I said, if you want to see it all, go to Locals and Super U. Yeah. We're, we're in the, the hands of the U.S. right now. Yeah, so if the Americans push back on this and they make headway, then, yeah. then I think Simil we'll all be saved and we'll all be spared. If not... Similarly, mm -hmm. legal challenges, you've got to look to the U.S. Uh, people have far too high expectations of Europe. And as I've said previously, I've tried to explain this before, the structure of European law is much more favorable to these controls than it is in the United States. So mm -hmm. it'll be yeah. the US where the legal, the important legal battles are fought and where the political battles are fought also. Yeah, look, it, it, it will be the US. This is where this battle is going to be fought. This is where Absolutely. this battle started. This is where it's yeah. going to uh, to unfold. Exactly. And Europe is, is along for the ride. Um, yeah, see. France will protest. Most of yeah. the European countries are just going to go go along with it. I see the people here so far; they're they're most of them are just unfazed by it. Yeah, they hate it. I mean, yeah. I talk to people about it; and they hate it. They say this is just a bunch of malakias. This is stupid. But if they enter uh, a cafe or a restaurant, and they're going to sit inside. Yeah. They they just play along with it. So I mean, yeah. Yeah. that's the attitude right now. But if there's going to be pushback, it's going to come from uh, from the U.S. This is where this I battle know. started. This is where this battle has to be fought. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Linda Key says RT has a May 1st article about Taliban warning about the May 1st pullout deal with the US. We were warned. Why is the embassy still full of people? Well, <laughs> I, I think that the warnings were there, or at least the, the indications were there, but they were disregarded. I think, as I said, the, the assumption was six months after the U.S. pullout, there might have been a problem. Nobody expected events to, to unravel, to, take, to, to, to happen so fast. Now, there's a lot of questions about this, why this thing has collapsed like a souffle so dramatically. Um, probably a, an issue to be discussed in a bigger program. But I'm going to say again, I mean, we're going to do in-depth programs about this issue, about Afghanistan. We might have to do it on one of our other platforms because, to the extent that I discuss it on my own channel, and I'm very careful what I say. I mean, I, I, mean, I didn't say anything that you won't find in many places, but even that, even that, YT doesn't seem to like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on the subject of YT, super chat from uh, Laurie says, "Why don't you move over to Odyssey or Rumble, where you can say whatever you want?" We are, um, we are, Odyssey we are, we are, and, we are, and, and and we're doing a lot. More. We're going to be doing and, a lot more. Than yeah. That. yeah, we're mm -hmm. going to be doing a lot more on on there. We're on Super U and Locals. We're very active on Locals, and like I said, Locals is now partnering with Rumble. So absolutely. we're going to see what uh, what happens there. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, but you know, t t at the same time, we can't and bitch you know, just, absolutely. And but we're not going to walk away from. YT, because of course there's a lot of people who follow us and hear us there too. So I mean, you know, we, we're going to we're, we're going to fight and argue our case everywhere. That's what we're going to do. Yeah, it it would be easy if we only had one place to upload. But <laughs> believe me, it's not easy uploading to six or seven different places. It's yeah. it's time consuming. But I mean, Absolutely. this is the situation. Absolutely. As if the new media space can create more partnerships. Yeah share their user bases, uh, yeah. work together, then yeah. that's a good thing. Absolutely. That's a good thing. That's how you're going to take on a behemoth like uh, like YT. Absolutely. By the way, Tucker Carlson, I don't know if you saw his open last night. I suggest no. everyone go see it. I don't know if you saw it, Alexander. No, I didn't. But boy, did he lay into uh, YT. Oh, YouTube. really? Oh, oh my okay. God. He really laid into them. Hmm. I mean, it was it was pretty, pretty epic. Good on I, Tucker. I, 
<laughs> I'm going to say I'm going to say that people should be much more worried about him than they are about me. <laughs> uh, I mean, being, he being really went at them. Yeah. He really, he really hit Absolutely. them hard. Most of it was yeah. was with regards to what they're doing with Rand Paul and all of this stuff. And he had Glenn Greenwald on, and he talked about oh, well. Rumble, all that stuff. Well, I, well, I definitely need to watch that then. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, where am I here from? Hunger. A short update on Lebanon. Fuel subsidy and soon power reduced to two hours a day. People relying on private yeah. generators. Gasoline is impossible to find. We've done many shows on Man, Lebanon. We've been Lebanon, yeah. we've been signaling the alarm for a while on Lebanon. I, know. I, I think know. we're probably one of the only uh, YouTube channels that is uh, absolutely that has covered People, Lebanon. It, it's astonishing how un how you know lack of interest there is globally about this because it's a lebanon is a pivotal country and of course quite apart from the terrible humanitarian effect of this which you've just described i mean it, lebanon's position in the middle east makes what happens there really important it it it, it really matters i mean it's a place where wars begin and could very easily begin again the extraordinary thing about lebanon is that this goes on and on and on, and there doesn't seem to be an end point. There is no final point of end to this horror in sight, because the political system in Lebanon is so congealed, so ossified, and at the same time seems to have such a tight grip that it won't, it can't be replaced, and at the same time, it can't be reformed. And uh, so the country continues to spiral downward with nothing changing. Well, I hope that's not going to be what happens to all of us in Europe too, because Lebanon, by the way, um, as many people who have been there say, is the most Europeanized of all the Arab countries. And well, I hope it's not going to be the same um, in Europe, but Regardless, it's very, very sad to see what is happening to that poor country. Yeah. From Bianca, uh, Rand Paul suspended on YT for calling for resistance to coup restrictions, urging us to stand up for our rights. Excellent video with Robert Bartz. Thank you. Thank you very much, Th Bianca. Thank you. Yeah. See, see the Tucker Carlson if, if it's on YouTube. Because I, 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 YouTube I, 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 Tucker talks about it with uh, with Glenn yeah, Greenwald, and absolutely. he goes into some good detail about it. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Can I just say, I mean, again, I mean, people should be allowed to say what they believe. I mean, you know, uh, people are entitled to whatever view they want on all of the things we've been talking about. But when somebody comes around and says, you can say this, but you can't say that, you can talk about this way, you can't talk about that way, and people are forced to engage in um, complicated language, well, then they, we're in a very bad place. They, they is, suspended a senator and a doctor, Alexander. He's a senator yeah. and a doctor. And a doctor, exactly. Exactly. Well, Think about that. A senator and well, a doctor. A practicing well, doctor. Well, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Bear in mind, I mean, we, this is only a couple of months since they did what to a president? <laughs> it's... Um, I... We had this... We had this concept. Uh, we, 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 had about this con this, yeah. we had this concept in Britain of the overmighty subject, the person who was more powerful than the king. It seems to me the United States is in a very dark place. Yeah. They let it happen. The minute you let them deplatform Alex Jones. Yeah. Yeah. That was the yeah. pretty much the beginning. There were some more people even before yeah. Alex Jones, but that was the big one. I know. And yeah. uh, everyone was saying this is not going to end well. And sure enough, then they went after the president. And this is the same thing that they're doing with the QR codes. People just, they, they let it happen and they let it happen and they think, oh, they're not going to come after me and it's no big deal and I'll just play along. Yeah, but you see there, absolutely. there is no stop for these people. There's no, no reverse gear. There's no stop. Absolutely. Look at the speed of which has happened too. I mean, we went from Alex Jones to the president of the United States within how much time? Mm -hmm. We, we, we talked about it in so many videos, even when Trump yeah. was president, that if he doesn't do something about big tech, it's going to yeah, be a I disaster. Know. And Absolutely. nothing happened, not with Trump, not with the Republicans, not no. with the, obviously the Democrats. But I mean, they had control. 
They had control of the Absolutely. House, the executive, the Senate. They had full control. And they did nothing. Yes. And you had every now and then you had these nice little sound bites of Ted Cruz uh, talking smart with uh, with Dorsey, and that was really good uh, good TV. But nothing came out of it. What no, came out nothing. of all those meetings, all those Senate hearings with Dorsey and the Zookbot? Nothing. And all these nothing. People, zero. But, but we didn't we didn't think that anything would come out. I mean, I remember saying this on uh, uh, in our in our programs. But can I just say? You go to places like National Review, which are, you know, the sort of mainstream, you know, the, the, the Mitch McConnell wing of the Republican Party. And they're, they're just not interested in this issue. I mean, they, they on the contrary, they support big tech. <laughs> they're, 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 they're absolutely, from them. absolutely, they're absolutely on, on, on side with them. So, you know, when you're talking about the Republicans, which Republicans? I mean, you know, there are some Republicans, no doubt, who do have a particular line, but the really, you know, the big corporate wing of the party, well, they're perfectly happy with all of this. Why anybody would want to vote for them, by the way, that's another mystery for me. I mean, reading National Review, reading, by the way, Washington Examiner, I can't understand how any of the things that these people stand for are at all popular. And I'm sure they know that. I mean, they... they have managed to basically win a lot of votes by saying that they're conservatives and standing for a certain conservative positions. They don't really share them. I mean, they're, yeah. they're not. They're not in that in any true sense at all. I mean, it's it's a completely um, exhausted party at, at, at that level. But that they still have that critical mass, those kind of Republicans, still the dominant faction, in my opinion, in the Senate. And without the Senate, you can't do anything. Yeah. House of Representatives is a bit different. David Williams says that Trump's first two years had Ryan in there. It's true. Yeah. Ryan yeah. was there, but, you know, he still could have done something. But, yeah, Ryan, oh, yeah. Was, a, R Ryan was a pain in the, in the you-know-what. Well, he was. I mean, can I just say, I mean, we mustn't ever fall into the trap of saying that Trump was a flawless leader. He wasn't. I mean, he made he 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 missed. He made many mistakes. He he lost the ball on many things. He did have a problem in that when the Republicans were in control of Congress, the congressional leadership was not with him. In fact, they were looking for reasons to uh, 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 to pull him down. I mean, they absolutely were. And uh, the the story about the fact that he wanted to give pardons to Snowden and Assange, and he was told that if he did, um, the Republicans would go for would support impeachment. I, I understand that's true. Yeah, that's how they play. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's how they play. They play hardball. Uh, Zariel is back in the house. Welcome, Zariel. Good to have you here. He is moderating as well. Thank you very much, Zariel, for that. And Asavet MD has just come through with a $20 super chat. Thank you very much, oh, wow. Asavet MD. And Sparky says, I'm a bit pessimistic about the U.S. leading the way out of the globalist crisis. Raised to be drones. Younger generations here have little initiative. And yet, and yet, I still think that it's in the United States that the challenge will indeed come, and also where where the legal challenges will come. Um, that's where the energy is, not just the en energy in terms of you know people protesting and doing those sort of things, where the intellectual energy is, yeah. and and that's ultimately what matters. Flying Boar wants to know an update on the Canada-China situation. That's an interesting story. Well, it is an interesting story, again, because um, I, I think that this isn't a, a Canadian citizen has just been convicted in China and uh, conceivably could face the death penalty there, and the United States is getting really angry about this. This is such a strange, just a change, because, of course, Trudeau was one of those people who I always got the impression was very close to China at one time. Perhaps he is. But um, anyway, it certainly turned out badly. But I think it's the Chinese who are now driving this thing. They are they are still very, very angry over the 
uh, uh, arrest. I can't remember her full name. Meng something. The Meng Wing. Uh, the Wing. Wing. Meng yeah. whatever. But you know the chief financial officer of Huawei. I mean they bring it up all the time. If you go to the Chinese media, it's still a very big issue in China, and the Chinese are very angry with Canada, and they're very very angry with Trudeau, and I think it's the Chinese who are now driving this this issue very hard. I don't know whether whether that's quite what Trudeau expected or whether it's what he wanted. But, I mean, the fact is he has got a fight on his hands. The Chinese are very, very confident at the moment. I've said this um, in many programmes. They, they, are, they are perhaps overconfident. Yeah. Uh, Trudeau is going to do what, uh, what they tell him to do. Yeah. So yeah. be friends with China one day and Absolutely. lock up. Huawei officials the next day. He just well, he goes along with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. From Hey Man, a self-reliant and self-sustaining power cannot be contained like the Soviets. If forced to choose nations, we'll have to put their own nations first. Well, I agree. And I'm going to say something else, which is that this new power system that's been created is potentially, you know, the Russian Chinese thing is potentially, as the Chinese have pointed out, much more powerful than the Soviets were. And it's got far bigger resources. And of course, it is conceivably self-sustaining. I mean, it's it's got all the all the you know natural resources that it needs if it organizes itself. But you know, this is still a very much a work in progress, and it might not be a work that's ever completed. And there's lots of lots of problems which could arise so you know let's let's wait and see but i certainly think that the globalist forces which we've been talking about so much didn't expect this to happen in quite the way that it has i think this has taken them by surprise for a long time they were in denial about it now they've woken up to the full implications of it it's come as a shock that longer telegram that uh, another viewer asked me about basically sets out their alarm about the way in which things have turned out. But, you know, we mustn't make the mistake of thinking it's all played out. We'll see how it works. We'll see how it works out. And we mustn't make the mistake either of assuming, you know, that the Eurasian powers are the good guys they're 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 out for themselves we must always think remember we must always be realistic about these things all right from simon has the coof blown up the globalist model for good china is closing ports and provinces due to the coof and shipping costs are up by thirteen thousand five hundred dollars by container yeah i mean this is this is the other side of it because i mean this is points to the contradictions in the whole project, because on the one hand, uh, as I said, they extend their control, which is what, what a lot of these restrictions do. And that's, you know, something they like. They like to have all these codes and passports and things. So they, that, that's, that's the positive side of it. The other is it disrupts supply chains. It increases inflation. It puts pressure on people. It makes people angry triggers protests it breaks up the globalist economy it increases the appearance of blocks all of those sort of things as i said this thing is ultimately utopian it overreaches there are too many contradictions at its base for it to work all artificial project projects face that problem because life human society the pulse of nations is far too complicated a thing to be controlled from one center in that kind of way from uh flying boar when will the eu sanctions on russia be lifted never <laughs> that's, <laughs> never that's, yeah. uh, and can i just tell you something the russians have quietly realized that they actually is actually good for them and many of them like it that way i mean if yeah. you go to if you go to people uh, um, in Russian farms, they're terrified of the day when <laughs> you know, sanctions are lifted and they have to compete again against EU agricultural products on, 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 on you know, so being sold in Russia itself. So at the moment, you know, they got they got this big market in Russia itself, which they're basically 
filling up with food. And at the same time, they can compete with the EU internationally. So it, it works for them. And, you know, we're going to see before very long Russian built aircraft flying and they got machine tools being built. They could do all kinds of things now. So, as I said, we'll never see this sanctions lifted. And, you know, most many Russians are quietly coming around to the belief that that's probably a good thing. Yeah. From Canale Italiano, without optimism, only being objective, do you think segregation passports will fail in France, Italy, Germany, and Greece and have to be revoked? Or you think we'll be in the same situation next year? No, I'm being absolutely realistic. I think we will be in exactly the same situation next year. <laughs> I think I don't, I, I, just, I don't think the protests are big enough. If there is going to be a place where um, there's going to be a sustained challenge, it will be France. Because, as I said, France is so unhappy and so angry. But it's also very demoralised. And... Says the polit political leadership is not there. If uh, Le Pen had, had held her nerve, I think that um, things might have been different, but she, she didn't, she wasn't, she didn't hold her nerve. And as a result, her star is indeed fading. Yeah, Martha says that uh, Le Pen has 50,000 followers on YT, while Philippot from the Patriot, Le Patriot, Party Florian Philippot has two hundred and fifty thousand. You guys well, might you want, may want to take a further look. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, he's, the he's the real deal. He's the one that's leading a lot of these uh, protests, and he was in the same party with Le Pen at one absolutely. point. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And you know, sometimes you know things can things can 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 change. People can rise up. All kinds of people can appear. You know, if 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 you know French history, if you know the events of seventeen eighty nine when there was the French Revolution. I mean, there was all sorts of people who were involved in the politics that led up to the events of 1789. And um, then, and a lot of them were talking in ways that did excite and interest people and cause people to come out onto the streets and all the rest. And then, of course, the revolution came. And almost overnight, all those people who had been, who had been, you know, the big names suddenly disappeared from the scene and it was completely different people who suddenly emerged and it may be the same with france now so you know le pen today looks like she's the big figure but it might be someone else it might be philip it might be someone else you know if that big change comes it hasn't come yet we're still yeah. at the moment in france in the old politics Leafy Bug says, I wonder if uh, future historians will look at the EU reign and puzzle at how the bureaucrats who created and are currently running the EU were able to draw upon the vast, rich, complex hinterland of European history and determined to zealously impose their reign of totalitarian uniform mediocrity upon the continent. There is so much, there's so much, so many good questions in that comment. Um, historians are going to have a vast amount of work on unpacking and unraveling this project. Um, at, at this moment in time, somebody's at my door, my wife's dealing with it. Uh, at this moment in time, we still have a huge amount to do. And, but there is, you know, so much is unexplained and unclear about the way this was done. I'm just going to help my wife a moment. Go, because go, go ahead and, and see yeah. what's going on. Okay. I'm going to be a moment. Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh... Catherine. All right, let's get to some more super chats here. Let's see here from Michael, Michael Ende. As for the EU, I think you are not fair to Varoufakis. He did the right thing, explained with books. Why? From Michael. Varoufakis, this is about did you catch that? Varoufakis, not all of it. I mean, you didn't catch it? As for the EU, I think you are not fair to Varoufakis. He did, he did the right thing. Explain with books why. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the Varoufakis thing real quick. Um, I mean, I lived it. Look, yeah. Tsipras and Syriza, Syriza, real quick, without getting into details, they came in, they put up a lot of threats to the EU. Yeah. They said, we want this, this and that. Varoufakis went up there. He met with Dyson Bloom. He said a lot of, he talked a big game. He talked a lot of good things, right things, right? He said a lot mm -hmm. of good things. This is what we're going to do if you guys don't deal with us in this way. And we're going to pull out and we're going to leave Europe. All these things, right? Mm -hmm. But their big problem, it was all talk. 
Exactly. These guys, all they did was talk. They had nothing set up no. to back up their talk. No. And no. everyone in Greece knew it. Everyone no. in Greece knew it. They said, these guys are talking a big game and it sounds great. This is great. Yeah. Look at look at Varoufakis walking into the EU with his leather jacket and his T-shirt, yeah. and he's sitting down with Dyson Bloom, and you know he's making Dyson Bloom look like an idiot. But the European yeah. Union knew that these guys. What are they going to back it up with? They're going to leave Absolutely. the euro currency and yeah. go to what? Yeah. When Tsipras and his government should have been planning six months in advance to get some sort yeah. of parallel currency or something working. Exactly. Some exactly. sort of system so that they can go to the EU and they could say, look, if you guys don't treat us in this way, A, B, C, and D, no, no. we're going to pull out. And if you guys think we're bluffing, well, we've got a whole system in place mm. where we're going to deal with, with the lack of, uh, of euros and the fact that yep, you same. guys are going to stop the supply of euros, which is exactly what Europe was going to do and exactly what they did. Everyone knows it. When you're mm. in the euro and you don't agree with the European Union, the first Thing they do is they shut down your money supply exactly and they don't care if people starve they don't care if people don't have money to go to the atm i lived no. it guys you could go to the atm and pull out 50 bucks a week that's it why because yeah. the eu wanted to strangle greece and they wanted yes. to strangle cyprus i saw it firsthand but Badufakis and Tsipras, they talked a big game but they had Nothing to back it up. Very much like Boris Johnson in a way, Alexander. Reminds me of Boris Johnson. They talk a lot, but they're not good administrators. They're, no. They, they don't understand how to run a business. Absolutely. They don't understand that if exactly. you talk a big game, at least build the infrastructure so that exactly. if push comes to shove, you can walk away. And it's going to yeah. be painful for Greece for two yeah. or three years, but at least you'll have some sort of payment system in place. Something. Exactly. They had nothing. Zero, zilch, nada. Nothing, nothing. And of course, if you'd done that, you'd have had three difficult years. But at the end of the day, there would have been some light at the, t at the end of the tunnel. There would have been a yep. prospect for a real economic revival, a real rebirth. But of course, what, what they've done is that they've kept Greece in a, in a, in a dungeon and it will remain there forever. Now, I, I, I am actually extremely um, angry about all of that because what actually Tsipras and Varoufakis did, and I blame Tsipras much more than Varoufakis, by the way. I mean, Varoufakis is an academic, an economist. He was never really a politician. Tsipras was a politician. He, he somebody who aspired to be the prime minister of Greece. He was the person who, as you said, Alex correctly said, talk the big game. What these people did was that they demoralized and divided opposition to what was being imposed on Greece, which was growing. I mean, it, the result is that it's much more difficult far more difficult to organize that opposition now. And there is, it might even be impossible. So instead of leading Greece out of the dungeon, they not only kept the Greece inside the dungeon, they threw away the key to the dungeon also. And that is something that I find very difficult to get over or to forgive. Yeah, you know what the the left parties, not the radical left, which is what uh, Tsipras and cities that were, that was their party. They were the radical left. But other left-leading parties, even the Communist Party, which is, I mean, it's not a huge party, but it does have, a, I don't know, maybe 3 4%, 5%. I yeah. mean, it does have a presence in Greece, the Communist Party. All these guys were saying, please, God, don't let Tsipras get into power because Absolutely. if he gets into power, they're such jokers Absolutely. that the Greek people will never vote in a left government ever again. Ever again. That was their fear. They yeah. knew that these guys talked a big game, but when it yeah. came down to doing the work, they didn't want to do the damn work. You know yeah. why, Alexander? Yeah. Because all these people never held a damn honest job in exactly. their life, exactly. ever in their life. Tsipras was, was born into politics. He lived politics in university. They never held yeah. a job in their life. They don't know what it means to say, you know what, if we're going to talk this smack to the European Union... We need mm. to build a freaking infrastructure. We need to build a money supply. We need to do something in order to exactly. back it up. Exactly. That's their problem. Exactly. 
Absolutely. That's exactly right. And can I just say, to just, just to complete that, I mean, uh, the thing that really, uh, uh, when it comes to Varoufakis, is he apparently, right at the very end, at the time of the referendum, he was coming up with some kind of desperate plan to set up an alternative currency. Far too late in the day. I mean, that was, that was, you know, that was almost... You know what he said? He said, I'm going to put out your use on pieces of paper. I don't... <laughs> I mean, was... Sorry, that's and what he said. Adolescent stuff, childish stuff, absolutely ludicrous stuff. They were talking I mean, about, we'll is, put a system is, in place, Alexander, yeah. where when you go to the coffee shop, yeah. you write an yeah. IOU. Yeah. I know. <laughs> here's here's and, three euros for the coffee, IOU. Yeah, there no, you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to say, if, <laughs> and to say, and to say, you know, that, you know, reading out all these great academic explanations of why the policy is wrong. To the EU is the right thing to do. Well, maybe it was, but the point is they're not interested. They don't care. That's they don't they don't they don't mind if they're wrong. That's not what they're about at all. Yeah. All all they all they did was made them angry. Making those people angry sometimes is the right thing to do, but it doesn't it doesn't help you if you don't have a viable plan B. And that's Tsipras and Varoufakis didn't. And I mean, they were bluffing and they were bluffing with Greece. And as, as they didn't Alex, think the Europe didn't know that. Of course they and didn't. As, and, and Alex correctly says the result is that, you know, it's questionable will we ever see a left wing government in Greece ever again in the future? Well, maybe some people here are too fussed about that. But more importantly, Opposition in Greece has been obliterated because people are so demoralized by what happened that they don't really see uh, any point in trying to organize again. So that's that. I, I mean, that is, to my mind, unforgivable. Their, their plan B, Alexander, was did you see the movie Dumb and Dumber? Yeah. With uh, Jim Carrey. No, their I plan B was that where they were going around Aspen, Colorado, like Dumb and Dumber, these guys, they were going around Aspen, Colorado, and they, they were like spending all this money they found, right, in mm -hmm. a suitcase. And they said they're going to return the money to the rightful owner, but they'll do it with IOUs. So when, when they finally had to return the suitcase, they just had a bunch of IOUs. They were buying Ferraris and five-star hotels. It was just a, a bunch of IOUs. I'm going to pay you a couple hundred thousand for this Ferrari. Here you go. It, it was literally a dumb and dumber movie. That was their plan at the end of the day. When, when they got to, to the 11th hour, their plan was, we're just going to work with the system of IOUs. That's how yeah. we'll uh, get through the whole euro crisis. I know. I know. It's just, I mean, you can't make this, sh this shit up. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. And as I said, I mean, I, 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 the other thing is, I mean, I, I, sorry, we, we were going off a bit into the detail yeah, here. That's, yeah. But, but, but I, mean, I, I, I can remember, you know, Tsipras going to, Mo to St. Petersburg, meeting with Putin at Spief. And I was hearing all these reports afterwards. And uh, uh, the Russians said, this man is a clown. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they figured, it, figured him out. He, he, meets with, he meets with Putin. He doesn't put on a damn tie. No, because his whole shtick was, I don't wear a tie, right? I'm one I know, of the yeah, people, I so I never wear a tie. I know. You're going yeah. to meet Vladimir Putin. Put on a freaking tie, man. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Put on a freaking tie. You're yeah. going to meet Putin. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah. You have to be yeah. the cool guy, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they, you, you, these guys are just... I mean, they weren't oh, serious. Boy. I mean, they weren't serious in a very serious situation. And that really is unforgivable. In the end, that is completely unforgivable. Yeah. But... Tsipras might become a prime minister again one day. It's <laughs> impossible <laughs> because because uh, uh, alternatives in Greece are just not there. Yeah. Well, you know, if the Greek people want to drive their country further down the the pit, yeah. go yeah. at it. What what can yeah. I say? <laughs> you know, what can you do? The, the the fundamental problem is those people who can who really do want change. They despair and leave. That has been the problem with Greece for a long time, and it's got worse. Yeah. Okay, let's get back on track. Hey, man, so track. screaming screaming at Russians or dehumanizing the Chinese won't work. It actually consolidates mm. Putin and Xi's position, in my opinion, like the ramblings of Philip, because he couldn't stand the rise of Alexander. 
That's a totally correct. That's, that's a very good, very good super chat. It's absolutely true, by the way. It is completely true. I mean, Putin and C are stronger because of the because of the West's hostility to them. And I mean, it, well, not the West, the globalist hostility to them. C is perhaps in a different position because the political system in China is well what it is, but in Russia where you could conceivably put up an opposition. You know what the Russians do? It's very, very clever, actually. They have these talk shows and they invite neocons onto them. <laughs> they invite neocons from America to actually go on talk shows and to spout all their anti-Putin things. And they're broadcast all around the world so Russians can hear it. And they say, well, given the choice between that and Vladimir Vladimirovich, we, we stick with what we have because that at least is ours and it protects us. Yep. Um, from Bianca, have you seen prop propaganda expert Dr. Pierce Robinson's eye-opening interview on Asia Pacific Today recommended, no. as well as Harvard epidemiologist Martin Koldorf's video no, on American thought leaders? No, I haven't. And I, to be honest, I mean, there are only so many hours of the day. So, I mean... Lots of things I haven't seen, and I haven't seen those. I'll look out for them, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much, Bianca, for that. We will definitely look for those. Flying Boar wants to know, what are the reactions of EU on Russia's hypersonic missiles? EU doesn't think about hypersonic missiles. That just isn't something they understand <laughs> in the slightest. The U.S. military does. They're very concerned about them. Uh, um, some of the militaries in Europe probably do. But the EU, uh, I mean, you know, for, as far as they're concerned, the, this sort of thing is completely beyond their conception and understanding. I mean, you know, if, if, if Hungary passes a law uh, to protect children, that's something they do understand and they get very exercised about. But hypersonic missiles, that kind of technology, is so far outside their range of thinking that I mean, it's a, it just doesn't even figure. Can I just say that's a fundamental difference between a real country, a, a, a real power, which the United States is. I mean, the United States, whatever else, whatever its problems, it's still a country. That's the difference between a real country and the kind of thing, the blob <laughs> that the European Union is. As I said, they they will focus on certain things but they can't really understand others. Yeah. Anatoly says, but are the globalist forces after a central government or maybe they are after a multipolar world, which they will run from different centers of power? They, very they, good yeah, very good question. I think it's, I think it's the second. I don't think they actually want exactly a central government as such, because you see, if you have a central government, then people can criticize it and challenge it and oppose it. So what they want to do is they want to have a kind of system that they control, which looks decentralized and amorphous, but, but which is at the same time uniform and homogeneous. And the way they will do it is through operating various international organizations. So the EU, for example, you have various entities within the EU that all work together, but you don't actually have a state, you don't have elections, you have a parliament, but that parliament is basically an empty vessel. You have something like that. It's a kind of post, post real uh, system. So that, I think, is what ultimately the one thing that the so-called rules-based international order that we're hearing so much about is all about. You have rules. It's not clear who makes the rules. Everybody applies them. They're enforced on everybody, but you don't have a government as such. And these rules are rules. Importantly, they're not exactly laws because laws have laws only exist when they exist through con consent and the fundamental fact of law what we discussed on that interview with Robert Barnes is that law limits its makers 
<laughs> that's a uh, that's a fundamental point to understand. It's a very interesting philosophical question. Uh, perhaps, sorry if it's a bit of a philosophical answer, but again, it's something perhaps we could discuss more fully in a fuller program, which we would have to, again, I think, to do with one of our new platforms. Yeah. From Cosmic Rain, hey lads, and sorry for being late. I'll confess, I'm feeling so depressed right now with the state of the world. Is there? Is there really no hope for us? Will the elite win? Will the Koof passports really? No, they the won't Koof, win. No, sorry, the Koof passports really have me worried. Well, of course, they won't win. They will lose. The problem is the damage they will do before they've lost. As I said, this thing is unsustainable. It's riddled with contradic contradictions. And it, it, it simply isn't attuned to the pulse of humanity. It just isn't. It just doesn't work like that. And the people, as, as we discussed, the people in charge, the people who want this thing, aren't clever enough in the end to make it work. So it will fail. But 10 years, 20 years, yeah, five years, whatever amount of time, 10 years, 20 years is much of the adult lifetime of a human being. And if it's 50 years, it's all the adult lifetime of a human being or at least many human beings. So, I mean, you know, we're talking about, for us, a very difficult period. It will fail, but the damage it can do in the meantime will be enormous. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's it, from a historical perspective, it'll be seen as a blip, as, as a stupidity yeah. by a bunch of stupid people who, yeah. uh, who thought they could build some sort of utopia and yeah. uh, who had this immense hubris and greed. But... It's going to do a lot of damage. And the question that, I, that I'm always thinking about is, will it be six months of damage? Will it be three years? Or are we looking yeah. at 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? Yeah. I just don't, I, I don't know. No, no that's, that's something that's unknowable. But at the moment, I don't think it'll be anywhere near close to 100 years. I mean, no, I'm just... But, yeah. but, but having said that, no, but, you know, but Alex's point is... Entirely like, will it be like the Soviet Union, Union like, say, a 70-year yeah. thing? Absolutely, absolutely, exactly. So, I mean, that's the point. I, I don't think it could be as long as that either, actually. But it, it will be longer than a couple of months to, be, to say it straightforwardly. And the amount of damage it will do in those five, 10, 20 years, is huge. And bear in mind something, of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed, I mean, the hardship and misery that caused to the collapse itself was a terrible thing to live through. And the collapse of this project, maybe liberating, but you know, who knows how unstable and troubled the world will be in then. But will they win or will they lose? In the end, they will lose. Of that, I am absolutely sure. Yeah, look at how the world changes. P people forget that 10 years from 1990 to 2000 when the Soviet Union collapsed were absolutely terrible years for uh, for Russia. Russia was on the brink of, of total collapse and, and being fragmented and splitting apart. Absolutely. I mean, that was the game plan. Russia was on the edge. But absolutely. look what came out of there. Absolutely. Out of nowhere comes this guy Putin and he puts the country back together. Absolutely. Yeah. And he really did put the country, like him or mm -hmm. not, he really did put the Absolutely. country back together. Absolutely. And you'd have to visit it, which I haven't done for a while now. And you had to have visited it then, as I did do in the 90s, to see the change. I mean, the difference is just, I mean, it's difficult to talk about the same, as if, as if they were two, the same country. They're completely different places. Yeah. From Brandon, Egypt is flexing its military against Ethiopia over the Renaissance Dam. Yeah. Do you think there will be conflict? If Ethiopia is unstable because of the civil war. Yeah, we got to do a show on Ethiopia. We it's, have uh, got to it's do It's unraveling. A show. It, it seems it's unraveling. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, it, it, not just that, but the business with Egypt is a very, very serious issue. And um, there's, they are indeed flexing their muscles. So let, we, we, let, let's definitely do a program about this and maybe maybe we might even think about trying to involve some other people who are close to this close to yeah. this topic and, and, and see what we have to do because you're quite right this is one of the big events that's coming now yeah thank you for that super chat we'll definitely do a, sh a show on that uh from eugene uh two pound super chat thoughts on eric zamour who's the french tucker for president 
Eric Zidmoa, do you know? No, I don't know him at all. I mean, I, 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 I don't. But I mean, you know, as I said, what I, what I do know. I mean, I have, you know, interest in France. Um, this is a country where there is opposition. Um, it's just not concentrated at the level of a political, of a, of a sustained political challenge. But France has its history of, you know, being. It is, after all, the place where revolution, essentially, the idea of revolution began. And the French people have never forgotten that, by the way. There is still a revolutionary tradition in French politics which has never been discredited or gone away. So we'll see. All right. Uh, Theodore sends us a super sticker. Thanks for being you. Thank you very much for that super sticker, 1999 super sticker. Thank you, Theodore. Simon says, any call-in shows planned? Uh, yeah. Yes, but um, I'm not sure if in the next week or two, because of uh, summer and and the holidays, yeah. we'll, we'll see. But we're yeah, we'll get back. To we we will we will be getting back to them yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, things are a little bit uh, slower in August. It seems yeah. uh, from Sparky. Globalist puppets are incapable of original thoughts or thinking ahead. Without the five eyes, macro psyops, they're number they're they're dumber than a sack full of hammers. <laughs> Absolutely. Correct. Full of totally, totally true. Thank you very much, Sparky, for that. Uh, Arkanan, uh, where am I? Here we go. Five pound super chat. Uh, Dimitris Kazakis of EBAM, even before the election of Syri Syri Syriza, laid out the exact course of events. Do you, Alexanders, know about EBAM? The, they're, they're the popular front. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're not a big, they don't have, no. they're, they're not a big party. No, they're yet. not a big party. Yet. If I have to say, I mean, the, the party, uh, uh, Alex mentioned the communists. Communists have a lot of clever people in them in Greece for all kinds of historic reasons. And they saw through Tsipras right away. And some of the most cogent criticisms of what, of him and of what happened that I saw came from them, but I'm more remote from Greek events than Alex is because I live in London, whereas Alex goes backwards and forwards to Greece all the time. So, uh, uh, but there were a lot, there were, there were, you know, lots of people could see, even I from London could see the way things are going to turn out. I mean, it, it didn't require great oracular or prophetic powers to see that those two, those two people, Tsipras and Varoufakis, weren't serious and weren't going to uh, weren't going to succeed. I mean, I, I, somewhere or other, I've got all the things I was writing about at the time, and I started writing about it during the actual election itself, which Tsipras uh, won. And I said, you know, I remember. I said, I hope there's a Plan B because I don't see one, and Plan Plan A can't possibly succeed. And I wasn't the only person. Yeah, look, it was fun watching Varoufakis make uh, Dyson Bloom look silly, but absolutely, you know, yeah. <laughs> you got to yeah, back it up with something. You know, <laughs> yeah. what, 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 what good did it do in the end? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Brave New Perth says, "Will China, Iran, and Russia be able to cooperate within Afghanistan and Syria?" I, well, that's the big question. I mean, they are cooperating. The Chinese and the Russians definitely are cooperating. I mean, they're, they're, they're clearly working hand in glove over Afghanistan. You can see that. I, I mean, I discussed this at great length on my channel in various programs. Um, the, the Iranians have so far been playing a slightly separate game. But I suspect before very long they're going to be involved in the discussions too. But the question is whether, given the speed of events on the ground, all these discussions, negotiations, plans that people have been making are going to keep up with the pace of events. We will see. <laughs> um, but I mean, that they are all working together. They are, definitely. They all, they all have the same objective. They want a peaceful, stable Afghanistan. They don't want to worry about one which won't be used as a base for uh, uh, um, you know, Islamic terrorist groups and which won't host American bases. That's what they all want to see. And I think they're all agreed about it. And they all agree about who should be involved in building it. But of course, it's the Afghans themselves, the Taliban and the others, who will decide whether it works. So we will see what happens. Eugene says, uh, Belarus's news agency, Belta, is flirting with the idea of giving refuge to Baltic anti-passport advocates in the wake of protests in Lithuania. Your thoughts? 
Oh, well, I haven't heard about that, but you know that that would be a very interesting twist. I mean, I, I I suspect there's a little bit of trolling going on there because Lukashenko does like to troll people from time to time, and Belter might be partly doing that. But you know, we'll see whether it happens. It'd be quite interesting, actually. Certainly, I mean, the way in which uh, Belarus's relations with the Baltic states and Ukraine has have collapsed over the last year has been remarkable, and it's a massive indictment of Lukashenko's policies because he was flirting with these people before and he opened the door to them. Yeah. What do we say about the EU? There is no yeah. compromise with Europe. No. No. The European no. Union, no compromise. No. Uh, from Sparky, incapable of original thought, well-meaning or not, leaders can only draw from past experience, but in the rapidly changing world, it rarely applies. Well, true enough. This particular world that we have, it certainly doesn't apply. The problem with our leaders at the moment in the West, the leaders we've been talking about, is, of course, they don't look back. They don't look at the past. They, their eyes are fixed on a kind of future that they imagine, which isn't a realistic one. And they're trying to shape the present in order to make it consistent with that future which they imagine whilst ignoring and basically abolishing the past it's a most extraordinary experiment very very dangerous one mm -hmm. anatoly says aren't the taliban headquarters in pakistan you know i've been told recently i didn't know this that there's actually two completely different organizations called the taliban in that part of the world i'm not sure whether this is true by the way but that's what i've been told that in fact there's a taliban in pakistan which is in a uh, uh, conflict with the Pakistani government and which is uh, um, outlawed in Pakistan. And then there's another Taliban, which is the organization that's fighting in Afghanistan, which is separate from the Pakistani Taliban and which the Pakistan government quietly supports. Whether any of that tr is true or not, I have no idea. And any uh, help that I can be provided by anybody who is listening to this program who can provide us with insight about this i would be i would be extremely grateful for but it is a fact that the headquarters of the afghan taliban is in the pakistani city in quetta what i understand is that the people who supposedly run the, pa the taliban in quetta have only very sporadic control over the actual pakistani Taliban fighters on the ground. Many of them make their own decisions. And this is a very loose organization that creates possibilities, but it also creates risks because it means that if the people who are nominally in charge aren't really in charge, they might they might cut deals, which the people on the ground might choose to ignore. So we'll just see. It's a very complicated situation, and I don't pretend to have all the knowledge or all the answers. Okay. Uh, Jimmy Swag says, 9-11, 20 years is a generation of subversion and demoralization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's extraordinary because for me, 9-11 seemed like it happened yesterday. It's one of those events which when it, when it happened, you just don't forget. But it's 20 years, and my goodness what's happened in that time and how much damage has been caused in that time. The globalist project was hatched in the 90s, well, even in the 80s, actually. Um, and it, it came to some extent into its own in the 1990s. But it's absolutely, too, it, was, it was since 9-11 that the whole thing gained its big momentum, its real, in, its real impetus. And when it's done, it's, it's done the most the most harm. Yeah. Asavet MD comes in with a $10 super chat. Thank you very much, Asavet MD. And Eugene with the five pound super chat. Allegations against China's treatment of minorities seems like BS to me. I think the Uyghur genocide is another Iraq has WMD's moment. Your opinion? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> now, I, I've spoken to uh, a British academic who visited this area some years ago, before it became even a hot topic. And he did say to me that there were some very tough things going on there and that he saw them with his own eyes and he was trying to get people interested and that he was very frustrated at that time that uh, people were not were not interested in, in what he had to say. But this very same academic who went there and saw those things 
or says he tells those things, and I believe him, by the way, also tells me that many of the stories that we're hearing about what's actually going on there are, in his opinion, BS, and that it's propaganda, and that it's not anywhere near like what some people say. So, you know, he's the only person I know who is an actual eyewitness. I'm not going to name him because he's actually quite active in uh, in the media too, and I don't want to embarrass him. But um, I, I do consider him reliable. So I think there is a genuine tough Chinese policy. But I, I suspect, based on what he told me, that it doesn't come close to some of the things that people in the West are now saying. That, that's all I can say. It's, it's, I'm, I'm sorry if I, it's not a completely clear answer, but I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about things I don't really know. It's, it's, not it's that word. It's, it's that word genocide. That, that yeah, I, 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 way too I, I, easily. I, way too easily. I think should never have been used. And there's a big mistake. Well, it wasn't a mistake. I mean, that that turns a word that has a had a concrete meaning and it you, turns it into some kind of propaganda word. And that is terrible. But it's the same that we were talking about with words, the misuse of words before. So we're talking about Chinese things. Confucius, the great Chinese sage, once said that the most important thing is to rectify words. It's very keen about rectification of words. And we should at least learn from that because that word, the G word, should certainly not be used in this, in this kind of context. I think it's completely wrong. Yeah. Rocky Lux says, George Soros is more dead than alive. Will the elites be fundamentally and forever undermined without his direction and money once he's gone? If only. Well, I, if only, <laughs> he, he well, has, exactly. he a couple of kids. I, th I think yeah, I know one one kid that he has, and uh, he's just as crazy as pops. <laughs> it's just as well, crazy as the dad. Well, absolutely. I mean, bear in mind also, like you know, that uh, you know, we, we we throw around names of people. You know, the, the present incumbent in the White House, the gentleman, Mister Soros. I mean, these are just. I mean, obviously, they're real people. But there, there are placeholders. I mean, there, there, there's a lot more going on around them. Uh, and we mustn't make the mistake of personalizing this on to a small number of individuals. It's, it's, it's not an enormous group of people that we're talking about, but it's bigger than just, you know, it's, it's, bigger, it's bigger than just some of the names, Soros, Gates, whatever. Gates goes or Soros dies or the gentleman in the White House, you know, the men in white coats come for him. <laughs> Things won't change simply because of that. Yeah. They've got people that they can bring up off the bench. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> right? uh, Absolutely. Hey, man says multinationals use the U.S. government like a credit card, the CCP like prison guards for their factories and the EU like a strange utopian <laughs> resort. Absolutely, quite true. Well, I mean, absolutely, very good. Yeah, very good. Very what, good. What's from? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Ryan says thoughts on China economically and structurally, internally. Reports are it's failing. Three gorgeous yeah. dam crumbling by the day could yeah. affect four hundred million people. I've been hearing. The trouble with this is, I've been hearing comments about this about China. For the last 20 years, I, I, I remember reading a book which, came, uh, which was about, you know, China's coming collapse. And that was written in 2020. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we've been hearing about these predictions about China's problems uh, for a very long time. I'm going to say a few things. I did go to China. That was in 2017. I was, I have to say, very impressed by the infrastructure, the scale of the infrastructure. I also thought that some of it, a lot of it, was massively overinvested. I mean, you know, you'd see a railway station in a village which would be more suitable, I would have thought, for a big city. I mean, you saw you saw a lot of that sort of thing. So there was clearly an awful lot of malinvestment that was taking place. Uh, undoubtedly, there are debt and credit pro problems within the economy also. But I didn't get the impression, that was in 2017, that this was a system that was in anywhere, anywhere close to being 
on the brink of failing or collapsing or anything of that sort. So I, 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 I think one should be wary of those predictions. Problems, they exist undoubtedly. And they are enormous because the country itself is enormous. But the overall impression I got was of enormous economic dy dynamism and vitality, most of it, by the way, coming from small businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, from Adam, limited U.S.-Russia-China war, possible without NATO or Japan? China-Russia war between the Russians and the Chinese. U.S. Um, U.S. against Russia-China. Oh, U.S. A limited, against Russia. Limited. A li a li absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't think in Europe actually. I don't think the Russians and the Americans are going to fight each other in Europe. But uh, between China and the U.S., absolutely. Um, I, I, I partly because each side believes the other is bluffing, and that's incredibly dangerous. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, we are with uh, F.L. McKenzie. I'm sure I still owe my best friend two pounds from primary school. I gave her an IOU. Um, <laughs> yeah, IOUs, they do the trick. <laughs> from they do the <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, well from absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, you know the, the, the Federal Reserve Board has, I think, discovered the art of the IOU and taken it to an extraordinary level now because essentially <laughs> that's how it's running the u.s economy as far as that I is true that is very true mm. from uh char 499 super chat mm. char hard thank you very much for mm. that super chat from uh cosmic alien off topic but just wanted to check are your live streams in the same day and same time i keep missing them due to not being alerted yeah we Fridays and Mondays when we're usually live streaming and it's yeah. usually the same time. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. we'll do a live stream in the middle of the week every now and yeah. then. Yeah. But like I said, August will be a little bit of a of a slower month. But month. hopefully yeah. towards the end we'll yeah. we'll get back on uh, on schedule. Yeah. Towards the end of August. Um, and from Sparky, globalist mess highlights the importance of passing culture down through the generations. Without this, the Bill of Rights is meaningless to millennials. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, and why does that? I mean, uh, first of all, that's absolutely right. And um, anything that isn't based on the past is frankly going to be incredibly fragile. But it's astonishing how people find ha have, have lost sight of this. I mean, I, I get to say something. One of the most uh, big people that we all know about, Tony Blair, who was an absolutely, uh, to my mind, um, emblematic of the globalist mentality. I remember how anti-history he was. I mean, he was he was very very hostile to, to history, to teaching of history, and of course, learning from history. He regarded that as you know, he was completely opposed to this sort of thing. And I remember at the time my, saying to myself, "My God, he's the prime minister, and he thinks that we should." completely forget our history and mm. I, I remember being really incredulous about this and asking myself you know how does he think he's going to build anything permanent when he has that kind of outlook yep from uh, leafy bug it seems to me that there will come a point when the battle lines are drawn between the eurasian bloc and the atlanticist bloc i think uh, you're absolutely they redoubt yeah. that the globalists will have to retreat to at that time i suspect a much more vital force will sweep the globalists aside. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. By the way, I think 2021 has been the year, is the year, when, if you like, the lines have been drawn. I mean, I think that that was partly what that longer telegram was all about. I think it, it, it's we, we now see that the sort of two blocks are manoeuvring against each other. There was a widespread thing, I think. I think the Chinese thought, you know, with the change of administration, they're going to get all their old friends back. Uh, things are going to continue as they went, go back to you know, the nice thing where they were under Obama and some extent, and even more under, you know, George W. Bush. And they're going to see the back of this bad orange man whom the Chinese didn't like at all. And everything would go back to the way it was. And interestingly, it hasn't quite turned out that like that. There have been a lot of people in the United States who still 
want to continue to do business in China in exactly the same old way. And we've seen the Chinese trade with the US actually increase this year. This is an extraordinary paradox. But I think at the same time, the more ideological side of the globalist project has now understood that, in fact, what they've done is they've brought, they've raised up this mighty power and that they have to do something about it. So, you know, you, you do see the lines being drawn, and that has happened this year. Now, how it will play out, which side will win, I don't know. But it's exactly as Alex said at the last part of the programme, they're retreating from those places where they can't really, which they can't really defend. They're consolidating. That's the plan anyway. They want to retreat. They want to consolidate. They want to prepare and they want to push back. And that's what they're going to do. And we'll see whether they succeed or whether they fail. Yeah, I mean, it is a multi, we're moving towards a multipolar world, but I think for simplicity's sake, it is kind of a bipolar situation that we're running into. I mean, you can call it multipolar because Russia, no. China is not a, it's not a formal agreement, a formal alliance, no. and you have some other countries, which are you know uh, yeah. kind of involved in this in this uh, in this block, but they're not. You can say Iran, Turkey yeah. floats in and out. Maybe you could say there's other countries, but it is a bipolar type of arrangement that we're moving into. Absolutely, absolutely. It's not actually. That's a very good point. I don't think it's a multipolar one. I think there was some talk of multipolarity. The people who wanted it to be multipolar were the Russians, because the Russians don't want to be overshadowed by China indefinitely. So I think they wanted that. They wanted a multipolar system where they would be able to keep the Chinese and the Europeans and all the others in balance. And might be one day we could return to that. But for the moment, it is clearly a bipolar system. Yeah. From uh, Cosmic Rain, this person's been asking several times, uh, I am a Frenchman, what do you think of Eric Zemmour as presidential candidate? Thank you. Uh, we answered that in, uh, we answered in the that. super I mean, chat. I, well, I, we have yeah. to look in. Yeah, we have to look yeah. into it. Um, Absolutely. I'm I mean, not so familiar to be, with. To, with to be Eric straightforward, I, I mean, I, you know, I haven't been following, the, certainly I don't follow the French television media at all. So, I mean, I, I, I just don't know him. Um, I, I need to know an awful lot more about him to but be able to comment about it. We do a lot of shows on France, so we'll definitely oh, uh, cover this. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. we'll look into it and we'll, we'll definitely well, cover this in a show, well, I mean, for sure. I mean, well, with what, with what, we're with we're the constantly covering France. France. Absolutely, we certainly are. And we're going to be covering it even more because obviously the elections are coming then. Yeah. Uh, hey, man says, uh, guest recommendations, George Galloway, Jesse Ventura, maybe Ron Paul. There could be a coalition of of the uncompromised, great show. Mm. Getting a hoodie soon. Definitely get the hoodie. They're awesome. Thank you. And those are great recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Galloway, great. Ventura, Ron Paul would be great. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it takes time to reach out to everybody too because we get a lot of recommendations. Just give us time. It takes time no, to, to reach does. out and yeah. organize and schedule the yeah. day and get everyone on the same page. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Eugene says, "Is if Greenland became independent, do you think Russia and China would heavily invest in it and turn it into a satellite state, perhaps keep missiles there to threaten the U.S. like Cuba in the Cold War? No. It's a short answer. I, I, I don't think there's any possibility or prospect of that at all, actually. Um, I, I don't think I think that they would not see Greenland in those in those terms. I think they would understand that it was be, beyond their reach to do that. And I think they, they would certainly see it if they if that possibility ever arose, they would see that as a massive strategic liability rather than an asset. So I, I, I don't I don't think that's happening in any way. Um, if um, it's not like Cuba in the Cold War and from a Soviet point of view, and I think this is a point people perhaps don't understand, they backed Cuba because they had an ideological imperative need to do that. And of course, they were able to work with the Cubans in Africa. But overall, Cuba for the Soviets was a strategic liability. It drained them of money and it was indefensible. And that was a major concern that the Soviets definitely, we know the Soviets had throughout the later period of the Cold War. So, the, you know, we mustn't uh, uh, assume that they would feel 
the Russians and the Eurasians would feel that way about Greenland today, and they would certainly not want to put missiles there or do anything of that kind. All right. Um, where are we here to wrap it up? Uh, Matt says, look, you can call him a puppet, but Soros effectively replaced the landscape of federal judges in America. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, our I, point I, was it's, it's the Soros machinery, the, yeah, machinery. the open society and, and everything, yeah. And I, 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 you know, I didn't call him a puppet. All I'm saying is he is a part of a system that is now greater than himself. I mean, he was certainly he was certainly instrumental in creating the system, but we mustn't make the mustn't make the mistake of thinking that you know when he passes away, when he dies, some you know the, the whole thing will crumble all around him. I, I I mean I don't believe that. When McCain left, did the neocons disappear? No, no, exactly, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. The, the, these guys, these groups, these institutions, yeah. they, they don't go away yeah. that easily. No, no. Uh, Amrit, why are, why are a majority of Anglo-Saxons so, so wrong about Italy and its capabilities? I, that's a very good question, actually. That is, uh, now, in terms of Britain, now, for a very long time, um, I think the British had a very distorted view of Italy because of the experience of the Second World War. I mean, the, the British, and it's partly a, pro a propaganda construct too, but the British propaganda during the Second World War was that the Germans fought hard and were a redoubtable and terrifying enemy, but the Italians were a soft touch. You know, you fought them and, you know, single British soldier, single-handed, could take on and defeat 100 Italians. It was largely nonsense, by the way, even during the Second World War. Uh, and it, 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 it is not true, but it was very widely believed in Britain and has to a very great extent still, I think, coloured British understanding of Italy. But I think the overriding reason why Britons and Americans don't take Italy seriously as a power centre is because Italian politics are so unstable. I mean, you had endless changes of government when the Christian Democrats were in charge. I mean, the you know, Italian leaders came and went. And then afterwards, um, even after the, you know, the, 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 the fall of the uh, Republic, the, the, the first Republic, when the, when the, uh, up with the Tangentopoli scandal, where you got Berlusconi, who was an engaging person, but you know, not perhaps the, a person you took entirely seriously. And no leader who's followed since has been anybody they would take particularly seriously either. A country, for a country to punch um, hard, it needs a strong political leadership and a strong leader or, 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 or collection of leaders. It needs, it, needs a, it needs a real government. And that's what Italy has lacked. If Italy ever develops that, if it ever sorts out its political problems, then you could start to see it starting to become a much more significant power than it's been. And by the way, at that point, many of its economic problems could begin to be sorted too. But of course, the EU doesn't want a strong Italy. It doesn't want a stable Italy, politically stable Italy, because the very last thing they want to do is an Italy with a strong leader who they might not be able to control. So bear in mind that aspect too. All right. Uh, Canale Italiano says, do you think that uh, PM Maloney of Italy would revoke the Kuf passports? I think that is a question which oh. Italians must answer. First of all, is PM Maloney going to happen? I mean, that's, that's the first question. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. And secondly, if it does, what will she do? Now, as I said, we are engaging heavily with Italian politics now, but there's an awful lot to ask, an awful lot of questions. We, at the moment, are ourselves on a learning curve where Italy is concerned. But Italy matters. If Italy changes, Europe changes. Europe changes, the world changes. So Italy is one of those places, you know, give me a full crew and I can move the world. Italy, in terms of Europe, could be that fulcrum. Mm -hmm. All right. The fair W says on the situation in uh, Zhenying, you should definitely check Daniel Dumbrill, who posts from China and posted right. a trip he recently made. 
Right. Okay. We will. I mean, the more again, the more one learns, the, the, the better. I mean, so many things to keep up to keep track of. But yeah. but Xinjiang is certainly important. Yeah. And uh, we have um, oh, Anatoly's. Where is it? Hmm. One sec. Let me find it. I lost it. Okay. Anatoly Biden's uh, MMSE scores are reaching freezing point, and Kamala's popularity is as high as Yanukovych's. Isn't it time to pull someone off the reserve bench? Well, <laughs> they're, they're working uh, at it. They're working hard. We'll go back to Cuomo. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, you know, the fact that there is factional infighting going on within the yeah. Democratic Party is a sign that things are not well. They're, they're I mean, trying that's to a, figure it out. Yeah, exactly. They're trying to figure it out. These are not people without some degree of ingenuity, and they will figure it out. Sooner or later, we will see who comes. Uh, Michelle, by the way, is by no means impossible, in my opinion. No, yeah. I, mm. I fully expect uh, if if this Kamala mm. thing doesn't work out, which it doesn't look like it's going to work out, I fully expect mm. come after the midterms, the, the media hype starting to build up about Michelle. Don't, don't Absolutely. be surprised. No. Uh, from Dennis, Cliff High made the prediction that hyperinflation will collapse the Biden administration. How accurate is this prediction? Well, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I think that the U.S. is still quite a long way from hyperinflation, but you don't need hyperinflation. Inflation enough can do a lot of harm. I mean, I, rem I lived through the stagflation era of the 1970s, and I remember how un unpleasant Unpleasant is an understatement. How how awful that was. I mean, you know, you see your savings melt away. You see the bills you have to you pay uh, rise. Um, people's wages are constantly rising. We try to push all the time to keep wages rising to keep up with that. That leads to worker uh, uh, employer conflicts, strikes, all sorts of things. So you know. In, in, a return of inflation is already a bad thing, even before you get to hyperinflation. For hyperinflation to happen, you have to have a whole lot of things happening at the same time. And you really do need to have a, a complete loss of control. And I don't think the US is 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 close to that point uh, um, at, at the moment, or, or, or even very close to it. So, I mean, you know, but inflation is bad enough if we have five, six, seven, ten percent inflation in the U.S., believe me, people will notice. Sparky fact: there wasn't time to agree on a new choice when Biden Harris faltered in the primary points towards globalists led by committee, not one. Absolutely. Oh yeah, absolutely. But, but absolutely. When you have a committee, there's always someone that wants to. Absolutely, was was a take take charge, but that's another that's actually another point because of course, I mean, just as they don't want weak, strong governments in Europe, they don't want a strong president in the United States, who might, who knows, develop their own opinions. <laughs> so I mean, they always have that they always have that problem to sort of juggle with. All right, uh, from Eugene, if India is to become a world power, it needs to develop its own geopolitical alliances. Can you see them making moves to consolidate strategic military allies and proxies in West Africa or Southeast Asia? They can do. And month, I expect that one day when they sort themselves out properly, they will. I mean, I think India is a sleeping giant. I mean, it's still uh, a very much an early stage. It's got, it's got a tremendously good diplomatic cadre. I mean, Indian diplomats are, are some of the best around and they they've got some very strong assets that there's some very capable people in their military for example but they still have many much to do many things to learn their economy is still very shaky in many things much of the country is still desperately poor um, the political system isn't particularly well run and there are massive problems of corruption so, you know, they've got to sort all of that out and then they can go ahead and reach out and form alliances. And when they do that, then, of course, we will see they, they do have, in my opinion, they do definitely have the potential to be another another big strategic pole. But they're nowhere near that point yet. But they are perhaps step by step. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. But I think they're gradually working there towards that. 
And Eugene also meant East Africa instead of West Africa. Oh, absolutely, yeah. East Africa. Obviously, I mean, it would have to be. And who knows? I mean, you know, it would be a, it would be, a, it would be a revelatory thing. I mean, India has a potentially strong navy. It's got strong air force. Got, what, what, what India doesn't have actually. It's, it's. Just, I mean, they do have an industrial base. They're very, they, they can be quite good at making some things, but at high technology, even though they got some of the most brilliant scientists and brilliant technological people around they don't seem to be particularly good at project management so to give an example when they launch on programs to build tanks or fighter jets where you'd have thought that india has all the means to do that it doesn't quite work out as it should so i i i gather that that the arjun tank that they spent about you know 20 years developing didn't turn out so well and i gather there's criticisms of the Tejas fighter, for example. So they need to get all that sorted out. They need to work out proper systems of project management. And when they do, which they will eventually, then they will fly. Then they will really take off. But they've got a long way to go. Yeah. From uh, Flying Boar, Ukraine sanctioning Russia. But when Russia built Nord Stream 2, they cry foul. You cannot have it both ways. Absolutely true. And can I just say, by the way, that we've talked about the EU sanctions on Russia. The Ukra Ukraine sanctions on Russia should not be underestimated because Ukraine was very much a key part of the Soviet industrial system. So, for example, aircraft engines, turbines, marine turbines, um, um, li liquid rocket engines, a large part of the Soviet shipbuilding industry. They were all in Ukraine. And right up until 2014, the Russians, for example, were importing engines, ship engines, for their warships from Ukraine. And then all that stopped. And it really did delay their programs in many fields, especially their naval buildup. The Russian naval buildup was slowed by about seven years until they started sorting out their, pro, you know, how to build these engines themselves. Well, they've got there now. <laughs> and that's what's happened. Because, of course, by doing all of that, Ukraine lost the Russian market, which is indispensable to Ukraine. The Russians have now built up their own industrial facilities. And at the same time, they built Nord Stream 2. So Ukraine is now looking in a very bad place. And from what I've heard, the shipyards... In places like Nikolaev are now practically idle. The great Yuzhny rocket factory in Dnepro, Dnepropetrovsk as it was, is pretty much idle. The Antonov uh, um, Aircraft Design Bureau is um, basically spent. And uh, uh, the uh, factories that built the turbines, they are basically ticking along simply on sales of turbine engines to China. And, you know, the United States is becoming unhappy about that because Chinese warships use Ukrainian engines. So it's, it's, it's not looking very good for Ukraine. Yeah. From, um, uh, I'm not even going to pronounce that name, N-H-F-F-F-C-B-H-D-D, -D, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's some handle that you have there. How much uh, five pound super chat? How much do you think the rise in authoritarianism is the elite self preservation in the face of global economic collapse? Uh, my name is Mark, by the way. <laughs> All right, Mark, thank you for that. Well, can I just say, I think, I think that there's a, I mean, you have both. On the one hand, you know, you have the, you know, this tremendous globalist outreach, this idea that you can build this globalist. Uh, future and this is a utopian project at the same time they are becoming nervous they're becoming frightened because it's not work the plan isn't things aren't going quite to plan and so at the same time you do have this clamping down this growing authoritarianism to make the project succeed but of course they have the power they have the levers they can clamp down on debates they can use the tech companies to control information they can lock up julian assange they can do all of these things for the moment so it's a sign of fear but it doesn't change the fact that these are bad things and they're doing great harm yeah from sparky chromos misdeeds have long been known why now 
Is he too hard for the establishment to play ball with? Are they replacing him with a more willing pawn? Yeah. That's <laughs> the short answer. Of course they are. Yeah. That's exactly what they're doing. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, we've known about, I mean, we did programs about him. I mean, maybe not specifically about him, but last year when we were covering all these issues, we were saying, you know, we were saying things about you know, what was going on in New York. There's nothing new here. I mean, everybody has known about this for ages. This is clearly the fact that he's fallen as a result of an interfactional battle. We don't know the whole story, but that's what this is clearly all about. Yeah. Edward Bernays, 1799, Super Chat. I always appreciate the Duran analysis. Fantastic, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much, Edward, for that. Mm -hmm. And from Stan, we have uh, the Taliban are Deobandi. Ultimate goal is Indo-Pakistan unification. Make British pay for barbarism. Well... I don't think Indo-Pakistani unification is going to come anytime soon. I think, on the contrary, these two countries remain adversaries. I wish they weren't, by the way. I mean, they have so much in common, including essentially a common language. I mean, uh, uh, Urdu and Hindi are, 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 are essentially both outgrowths of the same language. So, I mean, Urdu, in fact, Urdu was the dominant language. Hindi is a sort of Indianized version. Um, but um, I have to say, realistically, at the moment, um, I don't see India and Pakistan unifying. I do think people in Pakistan want, would want that at the moment. And I think um, the, the present government in India probably wouldn't want it either. So maybe it will happen one day, but not anytime soon. All right. Eugene says that Kuf passports will be the West's Chernobyl. Possibly. But um, as I said, don't, don't, don't hold too many high expectations of that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't want to sound, you know, like, um, you know, discounting the degree of resistance there is to these things. But I don't think that resistance is going to prevail in the short term. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I personally think it's going to be an accumulation of things that are going to build up with more and more problems in the economy. And I think the other thing that if you really want to talk about a Chernobyl, I mean, look at the money printing. <laughs> I mean, that's that's perhaps the most um, unstable, destabilizing thing of all. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, from Luke, 20 Euro Super Chat. It seems like the dichotomy for our future is is Debenoy Dugin's, Dugin's, Debenoy Dugin's model for globalism. I like neither. Do you struggle with this with this as well? Side note, Zemur is a joke. Maybe reconsider Melenchon. You've talked about him before. From a Franco Cretan friend. Oh, well, yeah. Lots of you, you're obviously somebody who, uh, uh um, talk about uh, Alexander Dugan, and we're talking Alexander. Melenchon. Am I pronounced that Mel Mel Melenchon, Jean Luc Melenchon. Melenchon. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You've, you've talked yeah. about Melenchon, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, we'll see. I mean, um, I, I have to say, I did read Dugan's fourth political theory some time ago, and I mean, it started very strong. I mean, it was full of some very interesting ideas and then i thought it lost its way and i you know i was waiting to see well what you know what is this false political theory what is this new organizing principle that he's going to come up with what 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 will it amount to and well it didn't i mean there was there wasn't any real way forward there so i you know i i and there wasn't very much i thought that would necess that would appeal very much to people who have to pay the bills who have to go to, to work, who worry about the things that worry people in their everyday lives. It was all very rarefied and rather intellectual, and I thought rather remote from people's lives. So there will be an alternative, but I don't think it's going to come from the intellectuals, to be straightforward about it. It's going to come from below, as it always does. And... Um, out of the resistance that there is, something will come. That's the way it always is. It's it's the resistance that people make, not from some you know great philosopher. And you know, Putin, Dugin. I don't want to overstate things. I know a lot of people don't like him, and for all kinds of good reasons and bad reasons. But I don't think he's going to come up with the answers, and I don't think any intellectual ever comes up 
with the answers to say it straightforwardly. All right. From uh, Second Jugo says, Russia and China sign a memorandum on the establishment of 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 winning of, of twining of international military cooperation. Oh yeah. What's your this take is, on this powerful move? This is an enormously powerful move. This is in my, in some ways the biggest event this summer. Actually, I mean, you know, we can talk about Afghanistan. We can talk about all kinds of other things that are going around on around the world. But uh, the Russian and Chinese militaries are now going to, are now training with each other's weapons, uh, sharing their technological secrets, cooperating with each other. And I just uh, read somewhere that the uh, Russian defense minister has just, done, has just made a statement about, you know, full spectrum cooperation between the two. And that is huge. That is enormous. And it seems to me they still pretend that they're not allies. Here we go. Russian Chinese armies to boost military cooperation to protect peace. And this is the Chinese defense minister. So Wang Fei, her stressed that armed forces of China and Russia con continued moving forward. So, uh, you know, this is this is a huge thing. And I mean, it, it does create a military, what is increasingly looking like. A military block and you know that's that's huge that's enormous these yeah. are two of the most powerful militaries of the world and i mean that's a, a a challenge which the pentagon must be sweating over moon dragon nord stream 2 update keep up the good work well 99 percent complete finished in september operating in December. I mean, that's a done thing now. I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 I mean, it's game over with Nord Stream 2. I mean, nothing is going to stop it being finished now. Um, and I just saw some opinion polls in Germany about this. And three quarters of Germans support Nord Stream 2. And it was the Green Party is the party that's supposed to be opposed to Nord Stream 2. 70% of people who vote Green in Germany also want to see Nord Stream 2 done. So Nord Stream 2 is almost there. It's, it's just round the corner now. The work will be finished probably within the next few weeks, conceivably even this month. And it'll be in full operation before the end of the year. All right, Seca Jugo sent us 10 euros. Thank you very much for that. From, um, where are we from? Look, what about Alain de ben Benoist? Benoist for France. I do. Alain de we, have you, to do, we have to do a show we on France. We have to do elections. France. Okay, yes. And I, ha okay. And I, have, to, and I have to get yes. in touch with yes. my French friends yes. and find out who okay. all these people are and then educate myself in them. So, I mean, you know, this isn't a, the, I mean, I, mean, I okay, used to we, know we, we got a show on, on on Ethiopia, Egypt, and on France. On France, absolutely together. Yeah, and you're yeah. going to get in touch with with your people. People, all right. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Luke, for that. Um, Adam McLean says South Africa joined the Kanzuk. Can the Kanzuk capital build it up? Again, I'm afraid this is something I'm. I, I mean, I, I I've missed. What is the Kanzuk? The Kanzuk, you, you always ask that question. Um, Canada, oh, really? Australia, New Zealand, oh, UK. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I see that. No, I, I absolutely. I mean, I never. To be honest, the, the, I mean, they were they were briefly um, in the in the um, BRICS, but I don't think that was it. I don't think BRICS is any reality anymore. South Africa's real connections, at least the the the, the leadership of South Africa. Is is with is with the what what is now being referred to by the Chinese and the Russians as the collective West. I, I never had any doubts that's about West. that. I mean, that's that's what it's ultimately that's, that's where it's alignment. Yeah, the collective West. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sparky giving giving him credit. Soros showed showed other globalists how to use NGOs to get around pesky laws, borders, and other limits put on their governments. Absolutely. I mean, you know, let's not let's not underestimate him. I'm mean, not by no means, actually. He's an extraordinary man. I mean, he's played a huge role in creating the era that we are living in now. Um, and, you know, his contribution should not be underestimated at all. All I'm saying is when he's gone, what he has established will continue 
without him. He's not as essential to the project as he was, say, in, in the 90s. Sparky's right. He, he pioneered the he NGO pioneered. regime change yeah, regi yeah. model. Model. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. No question. No question. Yeah. Um, from Stan Lipman, was Plato an intellectual? Is democracy better? Plato was an intellectual. And Plato is a good example of an intellectual. And uh, I mean, first of all, to be very clear about Plato, if you read Plato, and by the way, up to a certain point, I mean, you know, even modern Greeks who are not familiar with ancient Greek can read Plato. He writes a beautiful, clear Greek. He's one of the best writers ever. And he's one of the greatest literary figures ever. He is a genius. Uh, he is an intellectual of genius. But... He had this enormous project, you know, of setting up the academy, um, training political leaders, looking for the philosopher king. And of course, ultimately, it, it, it wasn't achievable because the world isn't run by philosophers, even though Plato very much wanted it to be so. That's a bit unfair to him, actually, because if you actually look at his life, and what the academy did, it, it, it did actually become involved in a lot of politics, actual politics at that time. So he had the idea of the philosopher king and all these very, you know, uh, esoteric ideas. But a lot of what he actually did was very practical. And many of the constitutions he was asked to draw up or the academy was asked to draw up by various Greek city-states, but actually quite democratic. So he's a rather more interesting man, well, a lot more interesting than people say, but certainly he was an intellectual, and he both shows the power of intellectuals and their limits. Yeah, and like says, one has to read The Republic. Oh, absolutely. Republic's aston astonishing. Very disturbing in places, but also astonishing. astonishing. Very, very insightful. And of course, if you're talking about the modern world, I mean, the way he talks about the big lie, the fact that, you know, sometimes you have to create myths, uh, deliberate myths, in order to keep the people in check. It's quite interesting. But I mean, you know, that I, I don't want to trivialize the Republic. The Republic is an extraordinary work and, uh, and a, 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 again, a magnificent literary achievement. Um, the laws also, by the way, his very last work, people don't like it because it's much less literary and much less polished, but it's also remarkable. And law, as we know it, as it evolved, and as we see the, the, the system of law, which we now see in such crisis in the Assange case, but the system of law, which people grew up with, is the combination of Greek philosophy, which was pioneered by Plato in this terms, and Roman practicality. And they created law out of it, what we conceive of as law today. Yeah, and Sebastian says, thoughts on the UK-Greek Navy deal and the state of relations? Well, again, I, I, Alex perhaps is more up to date with this Greek Navy deal than, than, us, than me. What I will say is this, Greece and Britain tend to be very close friends, or at least in the Greek imagination. In practice, Britain always seems to prioritise its relations with Turkey, but... The Greeks always like to think that the British are somehow going to come into their rescue and be their friends. And at the same time, we are heavily involved in the NATO structures. And if this is a deal to buy warships from Britain, well, our defence budget is off the scale. We have one of the highest defence budgets in NATO. So we're very we're, we're short of money for everything except by weapons. But Alex, perhaps you know more about this. No, uh, I, I don't know about I the, the, I mean, the yeah. details of the deal. But, no. Uh, I, I agree with you that when it comes to, to Greece and the UK, mm. I, don't, I don't think mm. the relations are that good. Actually, no. actually, I think they're they're in the toilet and they should be improved. But uh, when it comes to, yeah. to Greece, Turkey, the UK yeah. is fully on Turkey's side. Absolutely. Fully. Always, yeah. always has been ever always since been. the yeah. always has been ever since the 19th century. You know, yeah. it's a, not widely known. But when there was the famous Battle of Navarino, when the British, the French and the Russian navies defeated the Ottoman navy and it led to um, 
it was one of the events that eventually led to Greek independence. The British Prime Minister at the time, the Duke of Wellington, was, was horrified. Remember, communications weren't too good. And he actually sort of said it was an untoward event. And he came very close to apologising to the Sultan for it. So this is a long tradition in British policy to sort of support Turkey basically against Russia. And that means you know, Greece basically loses out. I believe that Tony Blair's wife was actually, uh, who's a lawyer, was actually representing Turkey during yeah. uh, many of m much of the Cyprus negotiations and stuff that was going on with Cyprus, something like that. But she was actually representing the Turkish government. I wouldn't um, surprise Tony me at all. I mean, I did. I haven't heard that, but it wouldn't surprise me at yeah. all. I mean, it's entirely it's entirely consistent. I mean, the, the British have a connection with t Turkey that goes back very, very far, and I, I mean that hasn't changed. From Sparky, eight of 10 people want to be seen as good little girls. Five eyes recognize this and frame their efforts as war, enabling those eight to justify their misbehavior. Yeah, absolutely. That's quite true. Yeah. Um, we mustn't underestimate the importance of the intelligence cooperation as well. And in some ways, that's even more important than the military power, in my opinion. Yeah. And from Leafy Bug says, nice shirt, Alexander. Thank you. Flag of Korea, I believe, by the way, South Korea. Country I visited and was hugely impressed by. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, an extraordinary place. Wonderful cuisine, too. Yeah. I think that's everything. Wow. Wonderful program. Let, let, me, just do, let me just do a final check. That We got all the questions. The Duran.locals.com. We pulled out some good questions there. I pulled out questions from the yeah. live stream. And, of course, all the questions from... Um, the super chats. We thank yeah. all the people that sent us really good questions. Yeah. Thank you to Valley S, to GEC812, and to Zariel for moderating the yeah. live stream. Thank you very, very much well, for great, your help. Uh, I mean, I, thought, I think it's one of the great, best programs, actually, we've done. One of the best live streams. I mean, God knows we've covered huge topics. Plato, Mélenchon, Dugin. Yeah. Well, there, there, there was the someone Chinese. in the live stream that said it was a busy week of news. It really was. Oh, yeah. This uh, 2021, I mean, these last couple of years, actually, I mean, you know, what people say that sometimes everything can happen in a decade and other decades, nothing happens. Since 2016, the world has been moving forward at a phenomenal speed. And um, this year, as I said, is going to be, it is a historic year. People will be looking yeah. back on it. Mm. I'm sorry. Uh, Seb Sebastian says that uh, in a super chat, U UK to gift two to gift two Type 23 class frigates in Babcock deal. Greece. Oh, well, there you go. Excellent. Well, that's that explains it. I mean, they may be gifted, but we still have to operate and service them. We'll have to get the uh, uh, we have to get the spares from Britain, and we'll have to get the training in Britain. And yes, they do actually add to our naval forces. Um, so I mean, it's a, it's a important because obviously we're squaring off against um, Erdogan's Turkey. And Greece is loading Erdogan up on frigates, huh? Absolutely, we are absolutely. But I think we have to, to some extent, because realistically, we do face a challenge. I mean, we, we have the Turkish fleet now operating in all sorts of places, and. You know, Erdogan sending fleets all the way to Libya and the Libyan coast and claiming vast areas of sea. It's probably not what we would want to do, but, you know, what choice do we have? Yeah. Okay, any final thoughts, Alexander? Final comments? No, I mean, I mean, I mean for three, the, the, three and a half hours. Three and a half hours. But, you know, the range of questions we've had uh, and the number of topics, I mean, does bring home exactly that point. You know, this is a world which is really moving very, very fast. Pieces are moving very, very fast, geopolitically, culturally, economically, in every conceivable way. So there's lots to talk about, and that's not surprising we set a program like this. But my goodness, what erudite questions we get. <laughs> but we have one more. <laughs> we have one more super chat that just came in from Sekajugu, which says, Global Times published an article saying Russia and China should punish Lithuania. I saw it. Because I of allowing it. Taiwan to open offices. Will Russia I accept? I, I No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I have to say, I thought it was a rather intemperate and over-the-top article. Uh, it wasn't just an article, it was an editorial, by the way. I mean, Lithuania is a little place. 
I mean, that the Chinese should get so worried and worked up about what Lithuania does. I mean, it shows also how oversensitive on some topics the Chinese are. On these sort of things, the Russians are much more self-possessed, I think. But, you know, they're not going to gang up to punish Lithuania. Why would they? Yeah. And Brian sent us a 10 euro super chat. Great program. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Very much. That was that was a long program. We covered a lot of ground. Gosh, mm -hmm. did we cover a lot of ground. Absolutely. absolutely. Eugene says, will there be many water wars? This decade what yes wars. yeah absolutely i mean you know bear in mind problems with water in ethiopia in iran. egypt in iran i was going to come to iran lots of places so lots of things like that going on i gather that china is short of water too i mean that's a, another thing we haven't talked about but in india but i mean china also has a major shortages of yep. water so that's one of the big things we, we're going to have yep. to talk about and um, yep. chinese jam, dams affect water in southeast asia so you know lots of things don't worry everybody there. bill gates is on it absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> he has yeah he, he has he has the solution to everything yeah because <laughs> yes he does you Cosmic didn't know, you did yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Cosmic great. Yeah, go on, go on. I mean, he's a he'll, he'll be a water engineer before very long. An absolute genius on this sort of thing. After he knows everything. I mean, he's he is he is the Renaissance man of today. He's an expert on all a real subjects. Da Vinci. A real Da Vinci. Actually, he did purchase the Da Vinci. The uh... oh, he did. He did absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough. Mm -hmm. uh, Cosmic Rain says thanks, lads. Glad we have the Duran channel. Thank thanks. you, Cosmic Rain, for that. Mm. All right, we will call it. A day. We'll call it a live stream. We will. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. for uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, have a great weekend. And uh, we have a holiday this uh, this weekend, a three-day weekend. We do. Yeah. So thank you very much. And, uh, yes, I hope you guys like the second painting that I put up. Yeah, absolutely. There. Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's a little bit. Uh, yeah, you lost me for a while. For right? a while, yeah. Yeah, I got you back. Mm -hmm. You lost me for a while. All right. I got you back. But it's a okay. great painting. It is a great painting. Yeah, it's a little, it's a, it's not as optimistic, but hey, <laughs> I'm just looking at the live stream. People are saying, all right, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go. Don't go, Alexander. <laughs> we got one more super chat from Marit. Just came in. Last second. Italy took time, but the industrial behemoth, it is just something that people in high-tech industries who work with their machines know. Absolutely. That's so true. The biggest industrial base in Europe, uh, second only to Germany's, and tremendous high technology and immense design flair. Italy is a manufacturing powerhouse, and people don't know it, even while they buy Italian fridges, Italian cars, Italian all kinds of things. So, you know, Italy is absolutely not to be underestimated. It can sort out its politics. It could be a major player, certainly in Europe and perhaps the world. Thank you, um, Rit. And with that final super chat on Italy, we are closing the show. Take care, everybody.